Hi, and welcome to episode 20 of Techno Crime Fighters Forum. Uh, this is where you get to spend several hours with some of the most fascinating people on the planet. Um, episode 20 of Techno Crime Fighters <laughs> Forum. All right, here we are. Anyway, we have a, an interesting show lined up. We, we spent some time planning, and we're going to modify the format to be a little bit more um, time conscious, and we're going to try to get a little bit more done every time. It's going to be the press, media, and current affairs, and how they've not been treating the TIs the way they should. Mainstream media has not been treating, actually they've been defaming the TIs uh, down through the years. And hopefully we're going to straighten that out by getting more and more attention. Also, uh, the last 30 minutes of the broadcast. Hello. Hello. Hi, Catherine. The last 30 minutes of the broadcast, we're going to talk about solutions, solution oriented, uh, how to get out of this uh, situation in kind of creative ways. We talked about that for a while yesterday. Um, also, I wanted to, uh, also, you'll hear me at the midpoint around uh, halfway through. I'm going to announce that we're halfway through so that we can better gauge our time and get a lot done. Uh, I also want to, before we get started, introduce you to um, Mindy. Mindy is here. She's doing she Hi. Hi, Mindy. She's always Hi, doing Mindy. the chat room. <laughs> She's always doing the chat room. And she might interject things uh, from the side. She usually goes through me, but uh, her contributions have been so valuable lately that. Uh, I'm just going to let her pop right in here when she has something to say. So uh, without any further delay, let's just start off by talking about the press. There's been some things happened lately. And uh, if either of you would like to start, uh, we have Catherine, uh, Dr. Catherine Horton, and Ramola D with us. Karen might be popping in because she has a doctor's appointment. And Millicent cannot be here. So uh, here we go. OK. Go uh, Paul, I just I thought I'd just jump right in. Hi, Catherine. How are you doing? <laughs> I thought I'd just jump right in and say that one of the basic problems that we have with press coverage of the entire targeting issue and the entire electronic surveillance issue and the entire non-consensual neuroexperimentation issue has to do with psychiatry and has to do with strategic deception. And pretty much, if you look back at all of the news coverage from places like the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Daily Beast, um, and recently this Vice documentary from the UK, which I had the rather dubious pleasure of watching last night, and which I'd really like to talk more about later when we get into it, um, all of these uh, mainstream media articles and documentaries start with a premise that we are dealing with a bunch of people who call themselves targeted individuals and who are gaining uh, support and validation from each other via the internet and are uniformly delusional and suffering from some kind of mass delusion for which apparently there is some write-up in the DSM about it, the Diagnostic and Statistical manual for psychological disorders, which is, you know, the darling of the psychological and the psychiatric community, which I'm sure Paul has a lot to talk say about later on, too. Um, so when we talk about me mainstream media coverage, we inevitably run up against the falseness of the psychiatry narrative. So, you know, that's they start with that as their premise and then they go on and they never look into the reality of surveillance or the reality of the use of non-lethal weapons on populations through weapons testing programs or anything else. And so, you know, that's I just wanted to put that out there as um, a kind of an opener. What do you guys think? <laughs> OK, that's great. <laughs> yeah, the DSM is a document that keeps expanding every year because they make up new disorders. And they control society by branding the disorders in different ways. Uh, for example, pedophilia. Pedophilia was a, was a, was a, uh, a deviance, a perversion at first. Uh, 
And now it's becoming redefined by the DSM to being a sexual preference. And uh, so, so what they do with this DSM is they control uh, means in society. And also what they're doing with it now is they're, sh they're uh, entrapping the TIs into this, um, this community of deceivers. And uh, it's just not fair. In the DSM, there's no legitimate scientific test for any of the, of the disorders. They're, uh, they're simply like checklists. Or, or indications, or you have to use your use your sense of it. And, however, there are pharmaceutical drugs that go along with each of these diagnoses. So it's a beautiful scam. How it works is you get a person in, and uh, you work with them. And uh, psychologists are are uh, make more money. Uh, the less healthy you become, the more. Uh, attracted your um, visits go year after year, day after day. And of course, they make kickbacks from the pharmaceutical industry. So uh, it's really a scam. And as somebody who has a degree in psychology, you know, my, my, my degree in psychology is not in uh, clinical psychology. It's in consciousness studies, which we'll talk about at the end here. But uh, it's, it's a giant scam. Not that talk therapy can't help people, and not that drugs can't help people, but psychiatry, like uh, science, has been used to trick and manipulate people. Uh, and now, this is a big thing, because the TIs, there's so many millions of you across the, across the, uh, the world that um, they have to be discredited for the rest of the sheep, sheep, sleeping sheeple to not pay any attention. So they're using psychiatry and the DSM to do that. And apparently it's leaking out through the mainstream media because of course, that's what the people read. So uh, what we talked about yesterday was several instances that we're finding uh, of uh, the mainstream media dishonest, uh, not only the mainstream media, but the alternative media and their dishonesty in presenting situations surrounding the TIs and other situations. Uh, Catherine, would you like to start in? Yes, yeah. I think this is a this is a very interesting topic actually because um, you know we 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 really jumped in at the deep end, didn't we? Because um, I think you are both right that the media and psychology have always been intertwined since day one. So there's no way to have a, a talk about the press or the media in general without actually going into psychology and how they try to use... Catherine, do you mean psychology or psychiatry? Oh gosh, the two mix in my head. I guess the psychology, depending on who you ask, you know, psychology or psychiatry. Psychiatry is sometimes presented as the more um, uh, scientific and more kind of towards the medical, um, uh, you know, uh, branch. And psychology is, you know, um, kind of more, well, theoretical of some for some people more esoteric but not necessarily so i don't really to be honest i don't really know where the exact um difference lies <laughs> well, let, me, let me interrupt psychologists don't have a medical degree psychiatrists yes. have a medical degree plus and if you know anything about how they make a medical degree it's a totally a mind control program <laughs> i mean first of all you have to be an exemplar an exemplary student and then you go through long courses of science mixed with scientism and all the all the notions of how we got here and all that stuff is weaved into your degree and you can't get a degree unless you buy those things you can't disagree with those and then after you've gone through i don't know four or five six years of this then you start an internship now this internship is very much of a, uh, it's like an MK Ultra fear-based mind control thing. Uh, they do torture, they keep you up all night and all day and all night, and you have to, you have to react, rather, or you have to, what is it, you have to respond, you can't think, 
You can't, uh, you have to, if you see this, then you give them this medication. If you see this, you have to give them this. So you're conditioned just to, well, you, you haven't had sleep in three days. You're, you're treating people that, well, really you need to do something right away. So, so when you get out of medical school, you are so entranced with scientism, uh, the wisdom of pharmacology and pharmaceuticals, and you're, you're webbed in with the, uh, with the pharmaceutical industry. So when you go out and you're a psychiatrist, here you are fresh, but you're really not fresh. You're not fresh in helping people and, and trying to get to the bottom of what's going on. You've, you're, you're bringing all this baggage and all this mind control into psychiatry. Now, psychologists use the same DSM, uh, but they can't prescribe the medications. That's the difference. Psychiatrists or psychologists are mostly talk therapists, which I don't know. I found that that, uh, that works in some instances, but it depends not on the degree, not on the credentials. It depends on the talent of the user. I've been to psychologists that have been very talented and have really helped me a lot, and other who I was wasting my my money every week. So, uh, so that's my rendition of psychology and psychiatry, and they're both not helping us right now. Not that they couldn't turn around and do that right now. Yeah, there could be psychiatrists and psychologists jumping ship, and as there are medical doctors. There are medical doctors curing cancer. Uh, yeah. They're dying, they're being slaughtered, but there are people that are really um, dedicated to helping people in all these different fields. So uh, anyway, you know, what I, two I, you know what I found really interesting because um, I, have, um, I haven't really met psychiatry at all, um, but psychology, I, um, I had to use some tools from psychology to understand complex human systems. And um, things like the cognitive biases and things like that, and um, what I call the, um, you know, the work of, of um, Milgram, which I call the Milgram effect, um, and that's that's really percolates through the entire system. So there's a lot of useful tools and useful insights, I think, that we can take. But um, I think in the case of the media, um, everything you said, Paul, has been weaponized, you know, um, for political gain. And, um, you know, I, I think when we're going through the media, we will see how they are, are playing on psychological tricks. You know, the, the, I think one of the most common used tricks is priming. You know, they prime you, they set you up in a certain way. And priming, and for those people who don't know, the way I understand it is, um, for example, if you, um, you, you ask people two questions, and depending on the first question, how you prime them, the answer will be different. So if you're running a survey, for example, and you want to find out how happy people are, um, and you could just ask them, so how happy are you now, you know, today? And they'll give you an answer. But you can prime them by um, de determining the first question. So, for example, um, if, you, if you say, oh, how did you feel after your girlfriend left you or after your grandfather died? And they'll think about the grief and so on. <clears throat> and then when you ask the second question, suddenly they will be, on average, a lot uh, less happy uh, when they respond. So that will skew the results, and that's, that's priming. Um, but priming can also be done uh, much more subtly, which is when you prime people with information. So you lead them to a certain conclusion, and the media does that a lot of the time. Yes, absolutely. And Catherine, in writing, when you prime with writing, when you start, you know, in, in the, whole, um, the whole world or the whole field of writing, when you prime somebody, what you're doing is you're framing the narrative. And what these um, so-called journalists, whom we, shall really sh whom we really should call intel agents, playing journalists, who are hiding out at the New York Times and the Daily Beast and Motherboard and all these other thousands of mainstream media outlets, including the Washington Post, um, and how they do it is they start off the article. You know, their hook, their angle, their, the way into the article is through that corrupted frame or distorted frame, skewed frame, or wrongful frame of, of narrative. So they start from the get-go with the wrong frame of narrative. I think that's very well observed, actually, because when you think about the entire, the way they like to frame, and I, I really, I really, if you could get onto the um, the Vice documentary, maybe throw screenshots, and also <laughs> the New York Times article where they interviewed one of the victims of the intelligence agencies. I mean, yeah. that's such 
a wonderful example of what, what you're saying because they frame the entire thing as, oh, are these people mad? Does it exist? Are they mad? That's not the question. The question is there's all this military tech and a bunch of totally psychopathic nutters are running amok with it. Then what are we going to do with it? You know? Yes. And not only that, you know, the Vice documentary, let's just wait in to talk about that. You know, the Vice documentary is an, was an absolute nightmare start to finish. Start to finish, they have this sort of undereducated college punk who shows up playing journalist, right? Playing interviewer and running around talking to a few people in the UK, um, you know, and the way in which he frames the narrative is right from the get-go. They call themselves targeted individuals. They have met each other on the internet and they're confirming each other's delusions. They're really mad. I mean, that's, that was not just the subtext. I think he pretty much came out and said it several times. You know, they're crazy. So he starts with that very wrongful frame. He does not start with surveillance technology. He does not talk about the fact that the UK has become the most surveilled country in the universe and the fact that there are CCTVs at every corner, that there are, you know, and and that's not the only thing. It's not just cameras, obviously. It's Stingray technology, it's biometric scans, um, and it's implant technology. So this guy has not done any research whatsoever. He reveals his absolute ignorance of implants and RFID chips, which becomes very evident later on in the, doc in the documentary when Kieran and uh, his friends who have been implanted and who have MRIs and who have evidence, therefore physical, documented, radiological evidence of implants in their brains, show them, show him their MRIs and pull out their meters and show him how the meters beep, how these recorders beep, the detectors, the bug detectors beep at specific points along their, you know, their anatomy. And despite all of this, this guy is proving his absolute uh, ineptitude and his negligence in terms of research. No journalist worth his or her salt should get in front of a camera and make statements without doing research. And this guy proves to everybody that he didn't do one iota of research on the, on the absolute existence and the, and the whole $10 billion worth of, you know, the RFID industry right, right now, the, the scope of the industry right now. No awareness whatsoever of RFID chips, no awareness of military technology, as you said, Catherine, no awareness that, you know, there are non-lethal weapons directorates in every country right now, and that directed energy weapons are being tested on populations. The governments have contracts with defense contractors, and these weapons testing operations are currently undergoing, ongoing. I could send this guy a list of links and a list of documents. He's absolutely out of the loop, absolutely, you know, um, ignorant or projecting ignorance. You know, perhaps it's a stance, projecting ignorance of that entire field. You know what? I think it's much more sinister, and I have got a personal stake with um, um, I've got a personal stake about the Vice, Vice documentary because they actually asked me for footage. So one day I just suddenly get an email from some, I, let's call him a dude, because, you know, that's how the entire conversation went. A dude asking me if he can use some footage from my, you know, videos. And I said, OK, which ones do you want? And then, um, you know, we agreed that, you know, he wanted to sh have, I don't know, six seconds from this and, you know, 15 seconds from that. And then I already thought, Hang on a second. I've got entire lectures where I explain what the hell's going on. And you want six second clips. Of course, you just want to flash it up and discredit me. And I thought, oh. and you know, let's remember these media companies. Yes, they are infiltrated by agents. And yes, the media, because they're also connected to the intelligence agencies, are also entirely into this satanistic nonsense, Freemasonic, Illuminati. That's true. Thing. And we'll see it all over the media. So let's just remember that they are called Vice, right? So, <laughs> That's an excellent point. <laughs> right? Hello, Vice. And I was like, I know what this is going to be, and I will just watch. And I just said, of course you can have footage. Of course. You know, so I gave him, I think, and that's another thing, because uh, we, I have somewhere here in my folders, I've got the signed contract with Vice that I give them permission, I think probably for eternity, to use those, you know, six and five second clips. So two clips, only one of them actually appears in the um, video and just a fraction of that. 
And then they said they're going to pay me a pound each for the footage. So I'm still owed to this day two pounds by Vice, which they still haven't paid. And I'm not, apart from here, I'm not going to say a word. And I'm just going to wait until, I don't know what, the British pound hyperinflates. And then I'm going to come back and I say, give me my one million hyperinflated pounds, please. But anyway, so, you know, I will charge interest. I'll get back in 50 years time if they still exist, which something tells me they won't. Um, so anyway, so now can I just show you, because I want to show you the following clip. And I kind of jump in right at the moment. And I'm not going to use sound. I'm just going to flash through. Um, so here we are. So this is the Meet the Targeted Individual Community on Vice YouTube channel. And I just jump in at 1 minute and 19. And you can see this collage they've made. This, for example, is the protest in London that happened just earlier this year. Right. This was in front of the BBC. These are real victims, a real protest. OK, those are all real victims. So they proceed to interview, I think. I think she's also a victim. And up there in the top left hand corner is a very famous interview. That's Dr. Ronnie Kilder, who was murdered. She was publicly executed with directed energy weapons. And this comes after for about t over 10 years. She was harassed by Norwegian intelligence who broke into her home, who stole documents, who then later returned some of the documents. And all of this, if you actually look up Dr. Ronnie Kilda and you find the interview in her home here, you will hear everything about directed energy weapons. And she also shows the military documents that generals have given her at one of the military conferences she went to because she was that high profile. She was the ex chief medical officer of Finland and there's a document that she flashes up in this interview, which actually shows a diagram of people being attacked with directed energy weapons from a neighboring property. It shows it. There's a diagram with little stick men being hit in the head from a house next door. So if, if they had just watched this one thing that they included, they would have you know, said something else. But look at, I, I can actually, I probably can play the quick clip that they used from me, right? Because that's also still mine. So look at this. Others' experiences and a community has formed. We're not having a group hallucination. This is actually something that's happening. They call themselves targeted individuals. This is a death camp. This is a concentration camp. I will So that's me saying this is a death camp. This is a concentration camp. And you know what? They took it from a video which people can find, I think that's the video where I'm attacked, like live, and I've got the measuring device, and I'm shot to utter bits after I publish a letter I got from the Fed, uh, German Federal Police Service, where they just say, please don't contact us ever again. Uh, so that was big. So I made it public, and as I was speaking, as I was recording the video, I was shot to bits, and I can be seen in that video uh, lifting up a thick aluminum panel over my head, holding the measuring device into the camera and the measuring device is just being hammered and hammered and hammered and as soon as i lift up this panel which then reflects back at them it stops and you can just see it just goes once like and that's it and then there's silence you can see it in the video that's a live freaking electromagnetic attack it's a military attack film and what did they take from that oh they didn't show any of the evidence but they say oh this is a death camp and a concentration camp yes it is guys if flaming is so that's my yes, absolutely. yeah it's extraordinary what you've pointed to Catherine is editing is crooked editing deceptive it's editing you know, <laughs> fraud. Criminal. Fraud. Deceptive. exactly this criminal fraud it's fraudulent editing it's strategically deceptive fraudulent editing and they have done that throughout this film so that literally you are bombarded with little snippets of conversation with the people in the film you know who are presented as the um sort of the typical the emblematic targeted individuals of, of the uk and of the world um you hear these conversations that are very disjointed that are little snippets and insights into the entire targeting phenomenon, but no information, no, um, you know, no um, co conversation included of electromagnetic weapons, no conversation included of microwave frequencies that have been recorded coming into one's home or can that can be recorded as impinging or impacting on one's person. 
you know, as we are able to do with our meters. Um, and I should probably just pull out my meter and just see what uh, I'm being bombarded with at this moment in time. And you can see, you know. So I'm sitting here in my room, by the way, and a car drove into my neighbor's driveway, which is not his car, and parked directly below this, this room window, but the driveway is just outside the window to my left here. And, and, um, and is hitting me. And in fact, I was looking around for my camera to record the hits because I'm using my shield here against my heart and I can hear the hits. So this is what's going on, guys. So you have a directed energy weapon carried in this car that is parked right outside my window. And, I can, and, and the hits are imp impinging and impacting on my shield. And then, as you can see, these are the milligauss readings for what's coming in. And well, I don't know if this is ambient or it looks like pulsed microwave frequency that's coming in from above, you know, and I can sort of take this around and you can see how the, the readings change a little bit. Um, I think also, you know what I discovered because I am, um, uh, this is something very, very important because you, um, Karen Melton Stewart and I, um, also Melanie Richan, we all hear the shots bouncing off shielding. So this yeah. is a military weapon. Oh, wow. It went up to 760. I think it's on the other side of your head, isn't it? Uh, on, on that this side. Uh, okay. Yeah. Oh, wow. 900. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Well, that's the direction of her car over there that's parked in the driveway. Oh my goodness. Yes. It's like, it's like almost double or triple because on the other side was 200 and then we just went up to 900. I have picked up amazing readings on this. You know, I have taken this meet this um, cell phone, which is not hooked up by the way. It's not, it's an inact unactivated cell phone, which has an app on it. And this app, the EMF app, uh, has recorded the most extraordinary levels of milligauss and gauss right up to the level of 134 gauss in the Kumon lobby. And I will post that video shortly. It is absolutely shocking. I'm sitting there and I'm being blasted a bit in the yeah. face and in the heart, you know. Yeah. And, it's, and it's, I've started to record this, everybody. I'm sorry. Sorry, sorry, forgive me. Because when you said you know, the eye shot into the heart, I'm shot into the heart as well, into vital organs, into lungs as well. But the other thing is that I think all women um, experience, and also the men who are targeted, we're also shot in the genitals. Um, yes non-stop and literally you can just you know you have to imagine you have to live your life shielding yourself shielding your private mm -hmm. parts because if mm -hmm. you leave them, you're shot into them so that's that's what we're dealing with it's like a, it's like an it, uh, an intelligence agency conglomerate gone utterly bonkers it um, is and you know what it's related to as we know and perhaps we should spell it out very fractionally just for people who may be listening who may be new to this subject is not merely are directed energy weapons being carried in cars and being used i suspect under the cover of these weapons testing contracts and under the cover of surveillance radar tracking that's been permitted to our local police departments under various fraud fraudulent laws including laws that permit experimentation on those under surveillance, because all of us have been wrongfully put under surveillance. Obviously, we are not terrorists. We are not spies. You know, we are mothers, we are students, we are doctors, we are housewives, we are retirees, we are nurses, we are writers, we are journalists, and so on and so forth, who have, you know, been wrongfully targeted by the insane Satanists, Zionists who are running these intelligence agencies. So you have um, you have the existence of surveillance radar weapons being used by local police departments, and you also have the elect what is called what some people call the electronic control grid, which, in other words, is the setup in all our neighborhoods at this point in time of cameras of tracking sensors, you know, these are RFID tracking sensors that are now concealed in lights, that are concealed in cars. So cars are being parked on the street in neighborhoods and they're being parked on the street for triangulation purposes to assist satellite triangulation of signals on our body and to assist cell tower triangulation possibly of signals in our body. So you, we, we could be getting signals either from cell towers or from satellites or from drones, and these are the airborne platforms, or from you know local areas where they have microwave emitters hidden in utilities, utility boxes, I mean, uh, you know, against light poles and also hidden in garden equipment. And I make all of these statements in a very, very considered fashion. There is actually documentation for every single element that I have just mentioned. Yes, there is. And, and 
uh, isn't there, Catherine? We both have seen varying documentation, and and I do want at some point to start doing videos where I pull out the documentation and show people the documentation and talk about it. Because I do not make these statements lightly. I happen to be a writer and a journalist. I investigate and explore and research extremely thoroughly before I commit to saying something in print. And similarly, you know, when I'm speaking as I am right now, because um, I, unlike that Vice documentary guy, am not somebody who rides on non-research. I, I look at the research first, I look at the information, and then I speak. Um, so, you know, that's what we have to lay out here. We are living in a situation globally where there is an electronic control grid that is both surveying us with cameras, video bugs, audio bugs, all sorts of devices, and now microwaves. As well as, you know, as well as um, tracking, tracking devices. And so that brings up that whole issue of RFID chips. And, you know, that is another world. And one, it's, it's an issue we should focus on one day because it's entirely possible that everybody is actually chipped. And we're talking microchips, you know. We all know about nanochips. We know that we are literally breathing those nanobots and the, the, these are self-assembling nanobots and so forth, and we're talking about little nanotech systems with antennas inside them that can receive and tra that can transmit and receive frequencies. So um, in the Vice video, I just wanted to point out that there was one moment when uh, one of the TIs had a um, detecting device and he detected chips on his own body and then he held them against the vice interviewers head or shoulder i forget and you know the thing beeped and uh, he turned to the guy and said you know looks like you've got to get yourself scanned because you look like you may be chipped and immediately our friend i think his name is matt shea um the the uk uh so-called journalist who ran this whole show the host of this program uh immediately said in a startled way yeah it could be a chip or it could be just something in the human body that's natural yeah it's just that the human body does make emit at megahertz frequencies like megahertz <laughs> You need to have, you know, something that exists, like, you know, emits like a mobile phone. Like if we were emitting at mobile phone frequencies, there would be interference, you douchebags, you know, when you're using your phone. But there isn't. <laughs> yeah, gosh. Yeah, I thought, you We've know, let's refer him to this physicist there. <laughs> We've got a question from the chat. Somebody wants to know what app you're using, Ramola. Ah, what app I'm using? Yeah. It's the free Google app. You just go to the Google Play Store and look for EMF app, and you'll see a bunch of them, and just check the free one. You, that's the one I've got. Right. And I, I don't want I, well, I think we're doing a great job in blasting these guys off. But I really want to make the point that, you know, the mainstream media, all the mainstream media, and I'd say 50 to 75% of the alternative media are controlled by the uh, Satanist, Zionist, whatever, whatever we're going to call them, the elites. They're not going to waste their money entertaining you. They're not going to waste their money giving you information that you that's not building on their program. So in addition, all, all, the, all the TIs out there, in addition to realizing that they're scamming people about you, they're scamming people about everything. The whole notion of war. war. War isn't shot with bullets and Moabs. War is, is energy weapons now. We're so far beyond that stuff that you're being scammed by the mainstream media to think that that stuff is still going on and weapons manufacturers are still making tons of money. But all they would have to do to win any war is to uh, take a TR-3, which is a levitating craft. It's uh, known as uh, U.S. Air Force levitating craft, and use energy weapons. They can wipe out entire cities. Entire so all this other stuff is is uh, is puppet show. It's all a puppet show. All the mainstream media is a puppet show. And now what they're doing is they're trying to take a legitimate, uh, the surfacing of a legitimate capture of the human race capturing the human race with this ti and energy weapons and turning it into a scam if you listen to the mainstream media 
you're being programmed. They make no bones about it, calling them programs. Uh, you're listening to a program. And I was actually, when, when someone, when we were talking about the Seth Rich situation and all the uh, media that jumped on uh, trying to prove that uh, Seth Rich, oh, it was the Russians and not Seth Rich, um, it's, it's another scam. They wanted to head off the truth that was supposedly, I don't know, supposed to be FBI reports by Seymour Hersh, uh, uh, released just recently. So before that, you have three weeks of mainstream media hammering the fact that uh, it's a false narrative about Seth Rich being the one to, to release the DNC. So, so that's how they work. They're, they're setting up uh, the, the, uh, the field, the playbook. They're putting your brain in a certain way so that when you see this information, you're not going to believe it. And that's what they're doing to TIs. And it's not going to work this time. There's too many TIs and they're too far awake. Yeah. I, know, I just want to very quickly interject something because I did find one photograph in the media that um, I just would like to throw in because you you know you mentioned the elites and we, we keep mentioning the elites and I, I kind of stubbornly call them the cartel holders and I would like to show you why. I'm just gonna share my screen and show you an image from the press and it's this one. It's Bill Clinton, the Pope, and one of the Podestas. Oh my and gosh. I, and I ask you, I mean, look at him. He's like, you're my hero. And he's like, no, no, you're mine, you know? And <laughs> just look at the three together, blow up the symbols, bring it up on your screen. And then whilst you're looking at this peak picture, say the word elites, because I can't. I literally, my eyes flicker when I look at these and I call them elites, they are not. They're criminals, right? No, they are criminals. The, yeah. the criminals have pulled, as as Paul just said, a huge one off on all of us. Yeah, they yeah. have. And you know what? That's why we can call them cartel holders. But elite sounds like intellectual elite, you know. And and it's uh, that's their word. Oh, mm -hmm. we. It's like no, you're not. You're a bunch of psychopathic scumbags. Elite yeah. scum. Yeah. Elite scum. Yeah. It's like the scum on the sea washes to the top. Yeah. <laughs> there was there was a there was a funny movie that came out called The Aristocrats. And all the movie was, was famous comedians in one joke. And they would tell this one joke over again. And uh, here's the joke. You'd say, oh, uh, we have a great act and we'd like to be in your circus or your show. And, uh, um, and the guy said, well, well, what do you do? So, well, we, uh, we jump on one another and we have sex uh, during the, the program. And then we uh, uh, smear disgusting things all over our bodies and we slide around on the stage and, uh, and on and on and on and on about these gross things that they do. And uh, the, the punchline is they ask, well, what do you call your act? And he says, we're called the aristocrats. <laughs> so so it's, it's, it's a joke. But it's true. You know? I, I think that's uh, what's funny. It's that's joke. why the fighters inside of the media, it's so funny. You know? Right. So uh, we used to have a friend who had uh, an acronym. She made it into an acronym. And I don't remember what any of the letters stood for, except the I was inbred. And, you know, so she, mm -hmm. she was, uh, yeah. So actually, Paul, just to come back to an earlier thought that you put out there that, you know, at this point in time, what they're trying to do is to pull one over on TIs and they can't anymore because there are too many numbers of us. Now, the fact of the matter also is that mainstream media is catering to, you know, the mind controlled masses who are being mind controlled through other means, through television, as you say, we're being programmed through the television. We're being programmed just through mainstream media, through the tone, the tenor, and the framing of the narrative constantly in articles. And we're also being mind controlled through actual frequencies. And there are many, many projects. If you go back in time and you look at the history of the CIA's covert projects, there are many, many projects using HARP, by the way, and Gwen Towers, um, using ELFs because the brain transmits at ELFs. 
extra, extremely low frequencies. So there are many projects all through time that have been set in place to literally send frequencies, whether it's through the power lines, you know, the lily wave to entrain the brain, or it's through the Gwen Towers, or through other means. So people have been, if, if you can think about it, all of us in a sense are susceptible to these waves and these frequencies. All of us are. But some of us have woken up and some of us have escaped those frequencies. And I know that Paul has some fabulous, you know, ideas for how to escape those frequencies and how to break out of the matrix, which we're going to get to shortly. Um, but, you know, the thought I just wanted to complete was that Everybody's mind controlled in this way. And then you have the mainstream media hitting them with these wrongfully framed narratives. So the people really who are being fooled are not the TIs, but they are the educated people. They are people that I went to school with and you went to school with. They are the people who are the practicing physicians today, the practicing psychiatrists, the practicing lawyers engineers, nurses, you know, they're people with degrees, they're teaching in universities and reading the New York Times in the morning, you know. So these are the people who are being fooled and who are being thrown these curveballs of absolute lies and absolute deception at them from people like the vice documentarians and, you know, the New York Times writer, Mike Maffate, who wrote this, that grossly deceptive article, The United States of Paranoia. You know, I, I, you know what? Oh gosh, I'm like <laughs> on this topic. I could just so go off on one. I have to say because um, you know what? I I don't even know where to start. I would like to go back to what you finished on, which is the this vice documentary, because one of the things that these, I mean, I have to say, you know, the my interaction with Vice, I really thought it's a bunch of you know, I don't know, early twenties shitheads. Sorry to enter in, you know, insult these people. But when I saw the output, mm -hmm. I was just like, you're a bunch of early 20 shitheads who've been just played by MI5, you know? Okay, anyway. But then I, I really, because I knew this is how it's going to be, but yet I just gave them the footage and I just let them run with it. And I was just sitting there waiting to see, so what's going to happen now? And I'm so pleased that, what, that it turned out like that because it's so blatantly obvious that what they did is try their utmost to utterly defame um, the victims. And these youngsters were a bit too thick to understand that these are victims of crimes against humanity. So actually defaming them publicly is a grave, grave matter indeed. And I was just watching, and as I saw my footage flash up, I was like, yes, you guys just earned yourself literally an entry ticket to a court case. And so did the guy who wrote the New York Times article. Because what they actively did is cover up, aid and abet the cover up of crimes against humanity. And I would like to point out how they actually did that. I really would like to show this because there are such mind blowing nuggets in this um, Vice documentary. So here, for example, again, I'm not going to play it. This is a still from um, 30 minutes, 22 seconds, because after they go through and they introduce all of these many victims, you know, um, they they don't talk to Dr. Barry Trower, a microwave weapons expert in the UK, for heaven's sake. They don't, don't talk to any counterintelligence specialists. I mean, we know the, U the UK is awash with agents and security firms. Not one measly counterintelligence expert who could say, oh, actually, you know this footage someone filmed of gang stalkers. Well, yeah, they are the surveillance network. Those people are surveying. You can see the hand signs, for God's sake, you know. Um, no, they just talk to this, what, psychiatrist who has no idea if she was approached by these youngsters like I was. I don't blame her because she probably she has she, never heard Catherine, about it. Catherine, I think that was a clinical psychologist. Oh, cl yeah, thank you. A clinical psychologist. So she hasn't got a freaking clue, nor did I. When I was a scientist, I had no idea about this entire topic. Nothing. She was probably asked off the cuff to make a remark, like I was asked off the cuff to just say a couple of words. So that's all I know. So I'm not going to blame her. But this woman here has no clue. So she was led up the garden path. She really was. I can't accuse her of anything more nefarious because I don't know. And my interaction with Vice tells me that these guys spent about a lunch break on this program preparing it. But then there are such amazing howlers because, as you pointed out, you know, at some point um, they talked to this guy who is, um, his name is uh, Lee Perrin, is that right? I should Kieran. Get, 
Kieran Lee Perrin. Kieran, exactly. That's his first name. Sorry, I should get it right because I watched so many of his documentaries. And this guy's case is mind blowing because he was implanted with a device that's in his jaw and, and also in his body that is used to um, survey and study, medically study primates in the wild. And doctors told him the precise make of the device that's in him. And he's got x-rays. And he's talking to this, like, you know, journalist who's a total muffin. This guy here. Hang on. Where's this journalist? Let's show his face. And he's like, yeah, but, you know, don't you think you're imagining it? And and um, Kieran is like, yeah, but I've got the MRIs. Yeah, but are you sure? Are you? And it's like this utterly gormless conversation with this dude where you think, are you really that fucking stupid? Or did MI5 pay you that much? I have no idea. Imagine he was looking at an MRI of this guy's brain and actually disbelieving his eyes and not asking questions like, you know, have you had a second opinion? What do people say this is, etc., and so on and so forth. And Kieran, in fact, had that evidence and, you know, ultimately presented a little bit of it. Absolutely. But uh, this guy's no. attitude was absolutely obnoxious. Absolutely obnoxious. And then there's another case. And when you actually take in what the footage that's shown here i mean i have to say i'm grateful they did the, the vice documentary because they just showed a couple of ti's i really want to get in touch with and i want the affidavits for the upcoming court cases Me too. i i'd love to interview them on my podcast so if anybody's watching please let them know i'd love to have their stories put out in proper documentation on yeah. my podcast and and you know what the one thing i i wanted to show is that this lady was shown here you can see a head helmet. I go to bed with a head helmet like that every night because I have to. And then shown here, again, this idiot. And then she's shown she's a normal woman. And they, they, she shows something. Let me just show this. Um, she has. She bought herself, I think, for seven thousand pounds, a lead blanket. And she has to sleep under a lead blanket. And she says, when I'm under that, I'm okay. And when I saw this footage, I thought that's what I need because I'm sleeping under an aluminum blanket and that's not enough. Yes, I thought so too. And in fact, Catherine, they cut out, they edited out any conversation she might have had about why she needs to sleep under a lead blanket. You know, what is what she's being hit with? Let me, uh, let me interject a few overview stuff. First of all, look at the handsome young guy fashionably with a little uh, you know, four o'clock shadow or five o'clock shadow interviewing her. That is attractive to the millenniums and the younger people. They just identify with that and it's like a, it's like a drug. Exactly, also, so they're being primed. They're being primed to look at him and go, oh, he represents us. Yeah, they do the same thing with Sean Stone and I'll get into that at another time. But uh, also uh, Catherine brought up uh, this psychiatrist, I think she was just a psychologist, knows nothing. What they've done is they've compartmental expertise to the point that they don't share. Like a medical doctor knows this, a, a, a particle physicist knows this, a psychiatrist, psychologist knows this, mm -hmm. but they don't. They don't. They don't allow them to get together, and uh, they start that in. They start that in elementary school. Put your book away, and then get your geography book out, as if it's a separate thing. History was created, geography, and geography created. I mean, and then in high school, you go to different rooms with different experts. So they they've done that from the beginning. They've taken us apart. They've taken little pieces apart. If you got a problem with your nose in the United States, you go to an eye, nose, throat specialist. You don't go to an internist. Or, so they, they've ruined our ability to cross, to talk across disciplines and understand the totality. We're an, an, we're an analysis society, not a synthesis society. And that goes with the left brain, right brain thing that we'll talk about later. Anyway, and so you guys are at what? Uh, just to carry on from what you just said, Paul, further, those very people are what I was talking about a minute ago, those educated people who pick up the New York Times and are fed the mainstream media garbage, you know, 
the distortions in framing of narrative, the distortions in narrative, the, the reframing of narratives, in other words, lies, they are fed lies and deception by the newspapers. So when they go to the newspapers for information, they are fed a bunch of lies and a bunch of whitewash. So there's no evidence, if you look at the New York Times, of any of this weapons testing that you and I know about. You know, or of the RFID industry currently, or of neurotechnology currently, and how it's being tested out on the masses about hive minding, about EEG cloning, about EEG heterodyning. You know, you have to get one specialized book from Dr. Robert Duncan for that to find out about EEG cloning and EEG heterodyning. You have to search out what certain neuroscientists are saying on the, on the web in order to find out what they are doing in terms of using neuroscience now with the Department of Justice using it you know in criminal justice programs they are using neuroscience they are scanning people's brainwaves but you won't find out any of that unless you actually dig and dig and dig it's not in the new york times it's not in mainstream media it's not in the newspaper and, you can't get any news teacher. over your morning coffee anymore right i can remember uh, uh being in the hospital being fed horrible food that's because the doctors doctors are never given the courses in nutrition I mean, why would they need that? They've got pharmaceutical drugs. <laughs> so, right. So it's a corrupted system, and we've got to wind our way through it. I, I'm sorry, you know, I didn't but, interrupt no, the floor. No. no, not at all, actually, because this is this is all valuable. Because again, you know what the thing about the doctors? To me, that's again, um, it's a, it's an artifact of human systems because the doctors are also compartmentalized. So the patients the patients go through the um, the hospital system one way, and they see it. Like, you know, it's almost like a hamster in a, on a, a rat in a rat maze. But the doctors are other types of rats in another type of maze. They kind of, you know, you cross paths with them. And, and one rat doesn't really know how the maze looks like and how it maps out. And um, that yeah. misunderstanding is, is a classic. So yes, each, each of those rats, in other words, doctors, think they're in a different maze. Uh, yes, absolutely, and, and also as much as the doctors can't can't understand what the um, what the the hospital system looks like to the patients, the patients can't understand what it looks like to the doctors because it's kind of like a higher order brain function actually to map out someone else's point of view. Um, but um, it, you know what? It's so interesting because we now got to we really took the Vice documentary to shreds, and I'm literally I'm just burning. What I really would love to do is actually get in touch with the woman who they show the clinical psychologist, psychiatrist, whatever, um, and and actually say, look, this is how it really is. Show her all the evidence and say, were you set up by Vice? Where do you think that now that you know this and your face is on that Vice documentary? that you're really annoyed with them because then maybe we can both sue them for defamation, for misleading us, for setting us up. That would be priceless. But anyway, so I'm glad, I'm glad. I'm still owed the two pounds, but it's so totally worth it, you know, to actually have the the, the res reserved right to sue these bastards, which mm -hmm. one day I shall. But anyway. So yes, <laughs> No, that's that's a great point, actually. You know, that woman who is interviewed, you have to ask you you have to ask yourself a couple of questions. One, is she truly ignorant? Is she truly unaware of what's going on? You know? Or is has she been totally taken in by that vice documentarian who just, you know, uh, came upon her one day and asked her these questions about this group of people who are seen seemingly delusional and so forth? Um, or is she, as you know, Paul says, there are there's a huge group of people, right? I mean, and we all know it, right? Who who call themselves the elite or the aristocrats or whatever, and uh, and are have infiltrated all of our different organizations and systems and functions in society. So is she one of those? Is she is she put in place deliberately to come on and act like the expert, giving the expert wisdom and expert knowledge, and actually, you know, trying to drag everyone under? Because what they literally are doing is precisely what you said. What they are doing is they are defaming the victim. You have reporting victims of extraordinary crime here. That's what targeted individuals really are. We are reporting victims of crime. We are, we are reporting evidence of assault, electromagnetic assault. And we have the proof for it. We have it in x-rays, we have it in scans, we have it in meters, we have it in these bug detect detection devices and so on and so forth. So when you turn someone away it, instead of looking at the, the evidence and you turn somebody away as by the way big big human rights organizations are doing today like the aclu and amnesty international and and all of the newspapers are doing i don't know how many countless numbers of journalists in mainstream media all of us have gone through contacting and gotten ridiculous responses from right um we've done all that we've contacted the so-called journalists 
and we've received no interest, no awareness, no investigation, no exploration. We've received, you know, complete stonewalling, in other words. So when you look at all, look at what these um, so-called journalists are doing, what the big human rights organizations are doing, they are all engaging in turning away the reporting victim, turning a blind eye to the reporting victim, refusing to listen. It's like, you know, a bunch of soldiers going to Auschwitz or Treblinka and seeing the horrors over there and just keeping on walking down the road and not doing anything about it. That is precisely what it is. And it actually, because at first, every single victim who goes to the press thinks they're the first victim, like I did. And I contacted I did too. all of the mainstream media in Germany, all the newspapers. Um, I also contacted a guy, um, um, hang on, uh, his name will come to me, at Panorama, the German version of Panorama. Um, I contacted him personally and I said, look, these are crimes against humanity, will you report? And he said, oh, that's very difficult. That's the only thing he could say. He said, es ist sehr schwierig. It's very difficult. And I thought, what the F is so difficult, my friend. But then, you know, uh, another experience I had with Luke Harding from The Guardian, I think explained to me what's so difficult. And, um, you know, let me, if, if I may just take a few minutes, because I think this really takes, goes to the core. Um, you know what? Um, I, um, when you said about this, this um, clinical psychologist, psychiatrist, whatever she was in the Vice documentary, we don't know, is she in on it or has she been fooled? And I think that's exactly the question we all have to ask as we're recapturing the, the human systems that have been corrupted by what is actually an organized crime ring. We have to say, is this person in on it? As in, are they guilty or are they just fooled or ignorant? And we have to all do that with the judges at the high court. I'm convinced that two of them had no clue. And the third one, well, he kind of his his uh, I don't know, his chair as he was batting me down, surprised me, shall we say. Um, and, and on it goes, you know, so we'll always find a mix. Um, and with the journalists, um, you know, this guy from the German panorama, I still don't know for sure, but he was reporting on all sorts of stuff foreign. So I was thinking, is he maybe actually a contact for the BND? So the German federal intelligence, and that's why he has to keep his mouth shut. Otherwise, he'll never ever get um, a, a, a gig ever again, you know. But then with Luke Harding, it was different because Luke Harding works for The Guardian. He's very high profile in the sense that he almost scooped Glenn Greenwald um, writing up the Snowden story. And I think there's one bit that I remember reading where uh, Glenn Greenwald um, actually, he was phoned up by um, Luke Harding and um, he just told him what happened. And Luke was asking lots of detailed questions. And when he put the phone down, Glenn Greenwald suddenly thought, hang on a second, is he about to write a book? And then he quickly wrote a book before um, Luke Harding almost scooped him, I think. I think that's the story. I have to check, but that's what I remember. So anyway, um, but my connection to Luke Harding is that Luke Harding was there when I was attending that high court hearing, Berezovsky versus Abramovich, at which I started being overtly targeted. You know, like, so it was totally obvious. Now, Luke Harding was there amongst the, I call them the gaggle of journalists. You know, they just washed in and out. And I was there every single day. And they came for the days where they thought, oh, there's some interesting, juicy bits uh, to report about the oligarchs and otherwise bug it off. But Luke Harding made a special effort to find out who I am, what I'm doing there in greatest detail. And at the time, I thought that's not unusual. He's a journalist. He's curious. Now, looking back, I think, hang on, why is he more curious than all the other journalists? And I think I found the answer. Because um, I met Luke Harding. He even invited me to one of his book presentations. And he, I think he was presenting Mafia State. That's this book he wrote. Um, and in, interestingly, in this book, Mafia State, Luke Harding reports being a TI in Russia. Because he reports that he went there and he started being harassed by the KGB or the FSB, whatever they call these days. And um, the st sort of stuff that he experienced was, for example, they went back to their um, flat. So he was there with his wife and young child. And they went back to the flat and they found that um, they were living up on the eighth floor or something. And the um, the actual um, um, uh, window of the, of the bedroom was open. So, you know, he walked in um, and it was it was um, opened with a lock that um, or the, the window had a lock that um, you know you couldn't open yourself. You needed to have a special key. So imagine you come back and you find your child's bedroom um, window wide open on the eighth floor, and of course the implication was, oh, your child can just um, you know drop out and stuff like that. 
So he reports that and much, much more, you know, of having basically his um, his interviews um, perped and, and cut off. There's one interview um, that he took part in where he says that it was every single time he said the word Berezovsky, the line was cut, you know. And he says like, oh, gosh, that's like, you know, the FSB who doesn't want us to mention Berezovsky. I mean, frankly, I think what indicates, you know, what that indicates to me is that there's somebody who has to listen in, say, Olga from the FSB. And she's got a choice, you know, when he mentions Berezovsky, she can either listen and write a report or she can cut the line and just continue filing her nails. And I think she will choose cutting the line. So, you know, anyway, um, so that's the background story. So imagine one guy who has experienced being a TI himself and experienced intelligence agency harassment. And by the way, the FSB harassed him because they thought he's an agent of MI6. And based on my experience with Luke Harding, I think I'm I leaning, you know, I, I, I tend to concur with the S FSB assessment. Um, because imagine after this experience and after specifically inviting me to his um, book presentation at Pushkin House in Bloomsbury Square in London, um, you know, we don't see each other for a couple of years. And then I call him up and I said, Luke, do you remember me? Um, we actually met at the Berezovsky vs. Abramovich trial. And in the phone call, he says, yes, yes, I do remember you. And I said, OK, Luke, well, you know what? I started being targeted by MI6, MI5 of this lot. And I explained what happened to me, which is virtually identical what he experienced in Russia. And I said, you know what, Luke, I came across all these other victims. And to me, it looks like people are being mutilated to death in their own home in the UK. And these are British people, not just people like me, you know. Um, and the, what he did to me is he actually, he listened to it. And, you know, in the phone call, you can hear he's got a smile on his face. Because the truth is, he couldn't give a flying finch about the British people. He's a journalist and he couldn't give a damn about British people being mutilated to death. He has got no questions about that. Where do I have this information from? What evidence do I have? He couldn't care less. The only question yet for me is, what nationality are you? And that's a question that, were used, that was used in perping prolifically in Oxford. You know, people would just stop me randomly and say, what nationality are you? Over and over. Even the guy who delivered the death threat on the way to my first high court, um, you know, the first day of the hearing, said to me, what nationality are you? And imagine after this experience, you call up a journalist and you tell him about human rights violations in the UK. He just smirks at you and just says, you know, what nationality are you? And that's all he had to say. So it blows the mind. You know. That sounds like it's trademark intelligence agency nonsense, you know, trying to say, oh, you have no right to complain. We've entered the second hour. I was Actually, asked to do that. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thanks for the reminder. Okay. And this is now, you know what? Oh, God, guys, this is the second hour is now all about solutions because we said, you know, we had a discussion. We said, oh, we're talking about all this horrific stuff. And should we do the second hour always work about solutions? Mm -hmm. And the truth is, guys, I've got a couple of examples queued up. And I just would like to show you after Ramola. Um, so that's what I've got to say, just brief examples and at every stage say, so I want to show you some horrific examples of really um, where, where media has been weaponized, not just to the point where it's dangerous, but to the point where they advertise murder or advertise other horrific crime openly. And I want us to all pon to ponder what on earth to do about it. But that's just my suggestion. But I'll let you get go first. Well, Dave McGowan, I don't know whether you know Dave McGowan, but he was a great researcher and he did open source investigations, which I want to start today. And uh, he uh, broke all the news on Laurel Canyon, which was the satanic roots of the hippie movement and how they were created. They would get sons and daughters of the, uh, of the intelligence agencies like uh, Jim Morrison, um, all, all the ones, America, uh, the three C, uh, the uh, Grateful Dead, they were CIA before they learned to play their instruments. Anyway, he broke that. And then he broke the fact that the deep state uh, created all the mass murderers. In other words, the phenomenon of mass murder is a, uh, is a creation of the deep state. Now, of course, that cost him his life. And uh, I don't know why I got into that. But uh, yeah, if you are a journalist and uh, you break this stuff, you're discovering this stuff, you're, your life's in danger. But I wanted to say another thing about that. What's cool about this? And all this horrible stuff and all this pain and torture is now we have a litmus test. 
uh, what uh, we know that they're not on our side. We know that they're working for the other side if they won't cover this topic. They won't even touch it. They won't even investigate it. So we have books published and we have people that write books and do interviews. But that's as far when it goes any further. I mean, you're not getting into Rolling Stone, GQ, Time, New York Times, any of those publications. Nice, because we know that they're there to deceive you. And uh, no matter what topic they're covering, they're covering it to, to put you in a place or you can be manipulated down the road. And they don't want you to know about this targeting stuff because this target is in store for you. No matter who you are, if you're watching this and you're not one of them, one of the tares, you are definitely slated to go in this program. That's why they can't let it out. That's why a lot of the targets don't even know they're targets. Yeah, and actually just one thought to interject because um, it's true and it's um, when you when you actually come to realize um, the scale of this because Ramola mentioned that by now probably um, almost the entire population is chipped. Catherine Austin Fitz mentioned something similar that actually the, the scanners at airports were, um, you know, were first put in to, to measure the, the chipping level in a population, you know, sample it. But then another thing that Catherine Austin Fitz says, and I think that's also totally brilliant, she says, we have to sue the press because in a democracy, they do have a function. If they sell us lies to, to the large masses, that is subverting democracy. It is actually subverting democracy. It is high treason. It is high treason to democracy. And, um, you know, they, um, they have to be in the dock along with all the others. Because they have, and in the case of the targeting, which is actually concentration camps, real life concentration camps in Europe and the US and elsewhere in the world, they are covering up Nazi crimes. Yes, absolutely. And that is a very important point to stress. And I just wanted to jump in right there and say that, you know, what's, as Paul said, and as, as, we, as we all just recently discussed, we don't know, we can't really tell which are the good guys and the bad guys. If you look in the media, are there some people who are ignorant and some people who are part of it? But if you look at the big names in media, the big journalists whom we all have contacted, you know, you've contacted Luke Harding in the UK. I contacted Glenn Greenwald in the US. Right, because I was targeted directly after Snowden and everything, after you know, all of those revelations came out in the press. I was targeted in late 2013. I wrote to Grand Greenwald, I wrote to Jeremy Scahill, I wrote to Trevor Tim of the Executive Press Foundation, or uh, no, not the Committee to Protect Journalists, I think it's the Executive Press Foundation. I could be wrong about what, uh, what he, he founded a foundation of a, a journalistic organization for the pre, for the pre, for the free press, supposedly, you know. To, to write the truth and so forth and so on. I wrote to him, he wrote back to me actually saying, I can't open your attachment because I can't, I don't know you. You'll have to put it in the body of the email. So I took my very long letter, which I had spent ages writing, which by the way, our intel agencies zooming up and down the street with their whatever their weaponologies, their cyber weaponologies to to stop me and to eat up my file. All of that had been applied to it. My file was eaten up several times. I rewrote that document. I had 12 to 13 pages of this long letter. I took the whole thing. I put it in my email and I sent it to Trevor Tim. Nothing fell into a void. I didn't hear back from Trevor Tim, who's who has set himself up as you know the leader of the free world in terms of free journalism and open truth and whatever. So he didn't write back to me. Glenn Greenwald did not write back to me. Jeremy Scahill did not write back to me. Peter Moss did not write back to me. These guys from The Intercept, you know, I wrote to a whole bunch of guys at The Guardian, at The Independent, at The Intercept. Um, some people from The New York Times, some people from The Washington Post, who I, th I had no idea then of how corrupted these organizations were. No idea. So I wrote to all of them. I heard nothing. Later on, much later, by the way, I did hear from two very prominent um, people in our midst who are targeted by the intel agencies that they had both met glenn greenwald they had spoken to him and glenn greenwald gave them to understand that he knew about targeting okay but he wasn't touching it what does that tell you what does it tell you so that is another issue the issue of how all of the big journalists all of the big organizations appear to have been gagged you know they what you, they have, sorry to interject because it just blew my mind because I just remembered, you know, the story that you have 
um, about not just that Glenn Greenwald knew about targeting, she, he also had a, a rough idea about the a number of targets, right? Yes, you, he did. Do you think you can, you can actually tell that anecdote or that story that you know about? Because that would be a story to break right here. Screw Glenn Greenwald. You tell us, Ramola. You're the journalist. Well, I'm very reluctant to name the two people who told me this without their permission, you know, and I have asked them several times and they've both told me several times the, the whole anecdote of their encounter. So I have two separate encounters in my awareness that they both had. One of them is a very prominent TI and the other is a person who is a friend of TI's and not, not a TI himself. But both of them have met Green, Glenn Greenwald or had protracted email conversations with him. Okay, so I know that one of them, in fact, the person who is targeted, by the way, think of what generous, good hearted people targets are, because this person told me, you know, don't mention this because, well, he didn't exactly say don't mention this, but he said, we don't want to drag Glenn Greenwald into this because we want to protect him. Why would we want to protect somebody who is not protecting us is my point of view. OK, which is why I went ahead and I mentioned his name because we are talking about the press today. It is too late in the day. I am being mauled to bits. You are being mauled to bits. Before we know it, one of us may be dead. You know, yeah. so I've, got a, I've got to commit on Glenn, Glenn Primo. He might have been a journalist at one time, but when he sold himself to the other, the guy beside Elon Musk that started PayPal, he sold himself for, uh, I don't know, $250 million or something like that to start a news organization with him? Yes, yes. Come on, come on. And he gets Snowden email, Snowden, I, I suspect also. He gets Snowden's email, he releases 1% of them after 18 months. I mean, come on. You, the, the, the whole the thing may have been a setup. He's because a Snowden, think about think about what Snowden has revealed for God's sake. I mean, wake up, people of the world. What has Snowden revealed? Has Snowden revealed that we are sitting inside an electronic control grid? We are all inside the electronic concentration camp. We are all being assaulted with microwaves, but some of us are being assaulted to death, and those are the ones who have been targeted. Exactly. Wrongfully. Exactly. If the mainstream media shows you a person puts them on the TV so that you know their name. They don't do it for nothing. They're not doing it for laughs. They're not entertaining you. They're doing it so you'll know this person, be able to refer to this person, and tell, perhaps trust them down the road. It's, it's, it's very easy when you realize that they don't waste their money. They'll waste their money on uh, putting you to sleep, lulling you into sports, you know, but, but if they're going to teach you something, documentaries are the same way, news items are the same way, unless they want to, you to see something that will serve their purpose later, you're not going to know them. And that's because the entire, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Paul, I was just going to interject that's because the entire scenario is run by the deep state, what we loosely call the deep state, by a whole bunch of intelligence agencies who are practicing strategic deception on all of us across the world. You know, and that's why the news media don't exist anymore. It, it's deceptive media. We can call them deceptive or deceiving media because they are not real media. And the, the whole phenomenon of Snowden, who came along and, and talked about metadata and phone tapping and so forth, Give me a break. You know, your brains are being scanned, for God's sake. <laughs> you know, it's right. not just your phones and your emails. So why does Snowden not respond, for instance? I think I've tweeted to Snowden a hundred times. I know others in our midst have tweeted. I think Catherine may well have tweeted to Snowden. You know, and Jeremy Scahill. I know Tyrone Dew actually went to a bookstore and where Scahill was giving a reading and told him, he got up in the audience, there's, there's a video of this, and I, and I posted an article about this on my website. He got up and he told Jeremy Scahill, look, have you ha heard about targeting uh, with these weapons, electromagnetic weapons? And Scahill looked very vague, and this is the guy who's written 300 books about dirty wars and special ops forces in Afghanistan and so forth, um, you know, and Blackwater both um, operating outside the country and inside the country, Jeremy Scahill looked absolutely innocent and said, 
oh no, I have not heard anything of that. No, never heard of Intel, never heard of the CIA, never heard of, you know, secretive targeting and secretive assault, never heard of RFID chips. Oh no, do tell. Yeah, no, never heard of it. So that's Jeremy Scahill for you. Sorry, I have, I have absolute contempt for guys like that who you know who are propped up to be brilliant journalists who have who have a thousand books look i've got his book right here dirty wars the world is a battlefield jeremy scahill doesn't know about targeting well now he does because taran you told him about it but what has he done about it has he done any investigation or exploration written any articles for the intercept i haven't seen any has he called me because i've written to him no, he doesn't care. So, you know, here I am, the lone journalist operating in the space. But, uh, and, and of course, Deborah Dupre, who came before me, you know, and then there's Vic Livingstone, who's written about it, who was a journalist, who's written a lot of articles. James Marino, a journalist who was targeted, who's written a lot about it. Elizabeth Cody, who's done a lot of tweeting and a lot of Twitter work, you know, as a journalist. She was a former reporter for the Atlanta Journal and Time. So we are the journalists who are operating in this space, not Jeremy Scahill and not Glenn Greenwald, who have simply turned tail and run or have just run into the camp of the aristocrats being paid $250 million by Pierre Omidyar to run The Intercept and pretend to be a truth-telling organization. I think you're absolutely right. And you know, one of the things that we have to um, uh, wake up to, I, there's, there's something really good that Dr. Ron said about the media. She said, we now live in a world where everything is upside down. In one of her videos, you can see her say, you know, every, you have to turn everything upside down. So, um, you know, the, what's, what's, what they call fake news is true. And what's presented as news is fake. But also there's an extra level, which is that the people who are presented as journalists are agents. They are intelligence agents. You know, they have trained with MI5, they've gone through the training and they've been planted at media organizations. So when people read the blogs, MI5 and MI6 exposed, they are high figure people named as intelligence agents in the British and the American media, you know, as actual MI6 agents and MI5 agents. And, and we have to get used to this thing where, you know what, doctors are serial killers, um, you know, um, journalists are agents, other people are agents and intelligence agents are a bunch of jokers. No one is who they're labeled to be. Yes, exactly. And that's, you know, when you look at look at press, this is we've sort of come to this point where um, the people whom we have all been trained to look up to as real journalists, you know, and the newspapers we've been trained to look up to as the newspapers of the day, the elite creme de la creme of the day, the New York Times, the Guardian, the Independent, etc. They are nothing of the sort. And in fact, we are getting more and more evidence that it's entirely possible that not merely are these are these so-called journalist agents, but they are complicit. They are working on the other side against us. So in a sense, we are being acted on and acted against as, as humanity by these so-called journalists. In, in other words, they're not just on the other side, they're criminals. Because right, exactly, exactly, which is why I think this is probably a very good point. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just took off, but I'm so angry. When I look at the world of the media, it does make me so angry because, you know, I'm a writer. Writers are supposed to work with truth. This is what I have, this is the idea that I've grown up with over the years, studying writing, teaching writing writing myself and now at this point in time over the last three years of being targeted becoming an independent journalist after being a creative writing teacher because i've been forced to because there's nobody out there writing what i'm writing you know so i feel the need to write in this space so in a sense hopefully i'm offering a solution one solution to this mass area of deception here among the press i'm offering my own self as a voice and I'm offering my platform as a space for truth telling, which is, you know, my news and media site and my blog, which is the Everyday Concerned Citizen. And I recommend that everybody start following Everyday Concerned Citizen rather than the New York Times for the real truth about neurotechnology, nanotechnology and directed energy weapons and EMFs that are being directed on all of humanity. You know, most definitely in the Western world, but elsewhere as well. Um, so hopefully that I'm offering one solution and, you know, maybe I'll talk a little bit later about my podcast as well, which I just started, but I want to give you guys the chance to jump into and not go on and on. No, I think oh, this yeah. is actually, no, you go first. No, no, you go first. Yeah, Paul. 
We have instant, we have ideas of how they keep these journalists in line uh, by Hastings, Brett Bart, and McGowan. Uh, they were taken out. They, they probably make them a deal. You know, you you come with us, you say what we want to say, or you don't say anything. Uh, which is it's tough to stand up against them. But there are a few people that are bold enough, and we have one of them with us that's willing to stand up and and do that. Now it's it's really it's really gotten to be a mess. It's full of deception and. Uh, I forgot what I was going to say the rest of it. So go ahead, Catherine. I'll, it'll come to me. In a Actually, you know what? Because we wanted to give you the floor because you had some great solutions that you wanted to present. But before um, I give you the floor, I just wanted to use just a few minutes because, um, you know, um, I, I really, it's about solutions. And we already launched into the solutions because Ramola's site, Everyday Concern, is certainly one solution, you know. It's like I'm, I'm newer to the targeting than, you know, um, all the other um, panel members. And every single time I need a resource, you know, I... I ask them and I go to Ramola's site. And actually just last night, I called her up on Skype and I said, can you give me more details about Agenda 21? She's like, of course I can, go to my site, you know. <laughs> and it's, you know, that's exactly it. You have to really read up and catch up on it. And the other thing that Ramola does, the Ramola D reports, I want people to understand what these, is, these are. We are running, not just, she's not just running a journalistic platform. She's also a member of a criminal investigation team. Because the police, who I will get onto with relation to the media, are currently suspended. Just, you know, just um, yesterday, I went to the police again and I talked to them for 45 minutes and I was surrounded, well, I was faced with one police officer who was, who couldn't care less that just 100 meters from his police station, there were violent crimes being committed. He couldn't care less because he's captured. But actually, there's something much darker underlining, uh, underlying the, the media and also the police force. And I really want to get onto that before I open the floor to, um, to Paul. And it's not to drag people down. I want to basically show now, open the door uh, a, a little bit, a glimpse, you know, uh, onto the true horrors that lie behind the media because they are c covering up mass murder. And I want to just give people a glimpse so that they understand and value what we, uh, Paul has to say and understand the urgency. And also go and check out um, Ramola D reports because that is an inventory that we're running. We're running a criminal investigation and she does victim interviews and she actually presents an ongoing criminal investigation. So if you want to get on board with this, which you have to because these are crimes committed against you and your children, you know, you have to um, see that. But now, just guys, just give me a few minutes because um, as I was preparing for the show, I came across some mind-blowing stuff and I, I've queued up some stuff that is, um, when I first came across it, it just utterly blew my mind. Um, so let me just share my screen and actually show you an introduction into um, the, the sort of crimes covered up by the mainstream media. And I'll start as a kind of um, you know, gentle introduction, I'll start with something that many people know, which is the announcement of the collapse of WTC7 by the BBC ahead of time. And there is this um, little um, video here saying proof that BBC and CNN knew that it's going to collapse. And what's shown on this video is a little BBC clip. It says terrorism attacks in U.S., you know, World Center destroyed by hijacked planes, blah, blah, blah. And as the interview pans out, um, he passes um, the actual um, report to a lady who will then report from New York. You can see the smoke rising in the background. And then as he does, she's reporting and says, oh, yes, it's ter absolutely terrible. And I don't know, maybe I can just... Um, you know, um, show you the sound. But otherwise, as she's reporting, you can see WTC7 still standing in the background. And she announces that it has already collapsed. So people can go to this video because it's BBC footage. I'm not going to play it, you know, with sound and all that. So please follow the link and, you know, search on YouTube for proof BBC and CNN knew um, about the WTC7 um, collapse. Yes, that's the rather famous gaffe the BBC made, Catherine. And every, I think everyone who's researched 9-11 knows about it, but perhaps not everybody knows about it. It's a very important point to make, that the BBC announced the collapse of that building before it happened. Absolutely. I, unfortunately, I lost the button where I can actually stop the uh, sharing my screen. Oh, here it is. Sorry. 
Um, yes, it is. And this is this is basically the scale of the crimes. They knew that mass murder is going to take place. And they are journalists and they just don't even bat an eyelid. So this is what this is the sort of stuff we're talking about, people. These are crimes against humanity. And remember, maybe remember what um Karen always says about um that um head of the NSA who was posted off to Britain just before 9-11? Was she instrumental in orchestrating this? You know? Barbara yeah. McNamara. She yeah. was sent off to London. Yeah. Um, and meanwhile, somebody else took over the NSA, right? That The deputy was Bill Black. Bill Black, um, yeah, Jr., who in the end, is he who's got um, fraudulent life insurances on his name? Correct. Yes, uh, you know, and he calls himself. Yes, appears, appears to be stalking Karen. Yes. Yes, exactly. So these are we are talking mafiosi criminals here. I mean, officially. Mm -hmm. And in f and in fact, on my reports, very recently, a very quick um, bit of info about my reports. I've had two long conversations with seven of Solutionaries Media Network, whom we all know, who I think Paul uh, Marco has interviewed several times. Um, laying out the evidence for the undeniable fact that the Grenfell Tower fire, the catast catastrophic fire, the, the inferno that played out, that took the lives of hundreds of young families and children and retirees and older people, wonderful people, innocent people. It took the lives of those people. It, undeniable evidence that this was also mass murder that was pre-planned, a pre-planned genocide, prefigured and pre-coded in television shows, in movies, in books from 30 years ago up to the present date. Absolutely it's astonishing information. And that's in my reports five and six that you can find on Romola D Reports, which is the name of my channel on YouTube. So if you just go to YouTube and click, you know, search for Romola D Reports, you should find those. But, but what the story that Seven brings forward is the story of complicity of media. So, you know, what she has helped open my eyes about media not just being complicit or si media not just being silent, but media being actively complicit in acting on humanity and acting against humanity. In other words, media is part of that elite mechanism that is, has been strung out for decades, unbeknownst to us, and that continues to be stringing out massive events of chaos on all of us and massive, you know, other ways in which they are messing with our brains. There's a lot of fear porn out there. There's a lot of chaos ridden events out there, all these false flags that are coming out. And by the way, Ole Damagad is another expert who is brilliant at analyzing these false flag events that keep cropping up. And hopefully I'll be interviewing him soon on Real Talk with Ahmed Anani. I'm really looking forward to that. Actually, actually, um, um, Professor Jim Fetz is also analyzing the false flags. And I'll get onto the false flags in a moment. Um, and you know what? Actually, um, everything you said is true. We just would like to put it into the terms because you said how media is acting on us. The way I call it is that they are also criminals who are, are part of an organized crime network. This is organized crime, people. Correct. And I want to show you the actual full horrors and everything well, not everything actually, but glimpses into all the different things these organized criminals are doing because that's what they are. And now, um, just look because, um, uh, just a second, um, I, I can I just take, um, I, I, I'm just going to take just a few minutes because I, I just would like to, I'm going to touch up a few things. Um, let me just um, share my screen very, very quickly. Um, because one of the things that I wanted this to be um, up to, so imagine here you have plainly these people announcing mass murder and not batting an eyelid, but you can see glimpses of other stuff. Now, this is something that is, um, this is um, Lady Bl Butler Sloss. She is being interviewed on BBC4, and for the people of the UK, this is hugely, hugely important because she was actually um, heading the inquiry into historic child abuse. So this woman, she in the end, um, I think, stepped down, right? So there was this entire debacle about the people who they appointed. And I think the person they appointed um, after her was Fiona Wolf, who was the, um, the, the uh, what's it called, the mayor or whatever they call it, the, the head of the City of London Corporation. So it doesn't get better than that. 
but everybody thought, oh my God, she's, she's totally nasty. You know, she has to step down because I think her brother was the attorney general during the time when the folders disappeared, yada, yada. So I'll read up the details, but now I want to focus on something else entirely. She's in the BBC4 radio um, studio, and then she is commenting on the actual um, invest or the, 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 um, uh, the elites and so on, and this entire child abuse, and something happens to her, and I want you to watch her right shoulder as she speaks. Please watch her right shoulder because something very curious happens. And this will take, um, I will play something like 20 seconds from this clip. But just listen because this is super important for the investigation. Oh, sorry. Let me just. Exactly. This is what it is. Um, just listen to the question and listen to the answer because this is a total bombshell. Let me just turn up my, my volume to maximum because. Um, and this is something very, very special. Do you have sympathy, though, with this view, which seems to be that there is an establishment, and it is an establishment that is protecting itself, and that if we are ever to get to the bottom of what has happened and the abuse that we know has happened at high levels, that it, it has to be somebody from outside and truly independent who uh, is chairing. So I'm not sure if the, um, the audio was loud enough, but... Um, what she asked is, um, do, uh, do you agree that there's something like the establishment? And if you ever want to get to the bottom of basically this historic um, child abuse, it's somebody has to be somebody has to be brought in from outside, right? And she's the judge who was heading this entire thing, and then stepped down. And now watch her answer, and please watch her right shoulder. First of all, I do believe that the establishment has in the past looked after itself. I think partly because people Oop, did, did you see that. She said the sentence, I think the establishment in the past has looked after itself, as in they covered up for each other. And then moments later, as her words sink in, I think because she doesn't have any ticks that I could spot, she undergoes something that to me strikingly looks like muscle pulsing. I think she was just shot in the shoulder. Just look at this again that the establishment has in the past looked after itself. I think partly because people Did you see that? really recognize the... Did you guys see that? Yes, the second time when I watched it, she definitely looks like she's been electroshocked. I, absolutely. She has been. And that is a total bombshell because um, this woman, what she says, she's asked, do you think we have to bring in somebody external, you know, and, and she says, well, two things. And then she goes on about how, oh, yes, but the judge can still do it. But her first sentence is, first of all, I do think the establishment looked after itself. And it goes boom, like that. And all of us victims know that exactly. Yes, and so it really proves that, you know, this is being used as the ultimate control mechanism to keep everybody in line, to keep all these public figures in line, all these figureheads in line, all these politicians in line, journalists in line, so on and so forth. I think that's, that is really telling. But, but also, it also means that there was a direct energy weapon in the Radio 4 studio, and they shot at him down. This is a live broadcast of a judge being shot at, in my view. It's, it's absolutely mind-boggling. And now let me just take two, um, you know, two minutes, because there's something very important. So we had you know, the announcement of mass murder. We had the live broadcasting of what, I, to me, looks strikingly like a judge being shot in the shoulder by a direct energy weapon. And then it gets better than that, because now, let's analyze this. This is a news article from the Daily Mail about an MI6 chief um, whose cover, it says, is being blown by a wife's Facebook account who put up pictures about their holiday snaps. You know, and here is a, a, an image. Sorry, am I sharing my screen? I, I can't see. Um, am I? Oh, I'm not sharing my screen. OK, let me just very briefly do that. Um, Sorry. So here, this is from the Daily Mail, and it basically says, you know, MI6 chief um, blows his covers, wife's Facebook account reveals family holidays, showbiz friends and links to David Erring, um, who's a, um, a historian. So this is from 2009, and it shows, you know, here's a, um, an image of um, Sir John Sauls, who, who was the head of um, MI6 um, when Gareth William died. died. But then when you go down, these are apparently the images that were uploaded by his wife. And 
one of the things that's absolutely striking is this image here. And it, it, at first, I didn't understand what on earth this was. But um, a, a person who's uh, the victim of these sort of elite criminals and mind control experiments said, this is the chair dance. So when women are being prostituted to these you know, so-called elites, these cartel holders, the chair dance is one of those things. And you have the wife of the head of MI6, apparently his daughter, doing the same thing. And in the middle of the picture, you've got a colorful parrot, as in she is parroting her mom. Now, do you think, <laughs> exactly, take this in, do you think that the Facebook account of the family members of the heads of a, an intelligence service aren't monitored really quickly so that there's, if there's any mistake, these images aren't uploaded? Well, of course they are. So this didn't go up there by mistake. This is an announcement. So what are they announcing? And look at these images, these women's, women presenting their bottoms, you know, she parroting her mom. Well, to me, it's like she's come of age. She can be pimped out now. Who's the highest bidder? Right? I mean... I think they come, I think they come of age at about uh, six months old in that, uh, in that fraternity. Yes, so well, they do. But just like... It just blows that's what, you're, that's what you're going to find. When you study, you see, you've got to see it as two separate races of people. And I don't think they're people. They're very different from us. They do things very differently. And their aims and um, their motivation is destruction of us. That's what they're out for. That's... That's what they're there for. And if you, if you look at them at all, I mean, they have to lie. Uh, they, have, they, they have to abuse their children to, to train them to be mind control slaves. I mean, uh, we, we know people in this community corrupted by that force um, down through the years. They're multiples. Um, so, so anyway, can I start the... Uh, the other thing? Okay. Uh, last time we were, uh, we were having one of these uh, techno crime fighter forums, we got heavily into how we're going to put together the documentation and really feel the great court case that was going to blow this wide open. And, it's, and that's very important. Uh, Ramola can say how that will help journalists get on to, I mean, their credible source. Um, and I was thinking, man, you know, rather than my doing this, I, I wish I was Alfred Blimbermann Weber or somebody who had this vast knowledge in court cases and where we could do this and how this would be. And I was thinking that I just really, uh, you know, am I helpful at all? And then we got turned on to uh, Brian Tu's information. Now, Brian Tu's information came to me through Eric Carlstrom, who I consider to be a credible source. I mean, he's a TI. I, you can take his stuff to the bank. He was really working hard to get us out of here. And he's really exposing this all around. Well, Brian Tu talks about ways to escape this and ways to get out of this. And uh, what it sounded like to me was escaping it through a different reality. You know, we're in a, a world of duality, love and hate. And I use the left brain, right brain as the analogy of that. I know that there are components of things that are supposed to be in the left brain and the right brain, but, but as an analogy, it, it really works. And I was thinking, well, most of the things that he's recommending are um, right brain functions. Well, that's my thing. I mean, uh, I started off teaching creativity in schools. Uh, I was in business. That's what uh, Catherine and I have in common. I've, I've been in business analysis, uh, how to train organizations, how to change them, how to move them, uh, working with people. And then in uh, my final analysis, my final uh, study was consciousness. I have a degree in psychology but my major is consciousness studies, which I thought would be important in this, in this time. And, and damn, it's turning out to be that's the case. So I wanted to suggest 
a bunch of ways or actually a research project to figure out other ways to beat the system. And I used the analogy yesterday with, uh, with the team of a rat in the maze. Scientists use rats in the maze to um, discover a lot of different things. And I think that what's happening with the targeted individuals, they're like rats in the maze. According to Brian too, what they do is they give you um, they give you frustrating stimulus and you respond and then they try to respond your response in the hive mind, in the big grain, through a clone who's watching you. We have an example of a clone that works with one of our members, his, his name is Randy Webster. Um, that's what they're doing. Now, uh, finding your way out of the maze, you might be able to find a glitch. You might be able to find part of the uh, part of the judicial system who will provide that glitch. We might be able to find out by publishing enough, getting enough of us rats together. Excuse me for calling them rats, but so we can share things. There might be ways to beat it in the system. But if you know anything about science. Although rats are in a lot of bunch, a bunch of experiments, they they don't have any inherent interest in research, and they would climb out of the maze in a heartbeat and go on to whatever rats do during the day. Uh, the reason they stay in is because there's a plexiglass sheet that the scientists are watching through. Well, for us, we're humans. We don't have the plexiglass sheet. We can find another way out through other means. We're connected to the great source. We are um, the left brain, which we're taught to use all of our schooling, unless you were lucky enough to have an art teacher uh, in elementary or high school, all of your schooling was directed toward putting you in to your left brain. We only value left brain. The IQ test and all the tests that qualify you for college or university are left brain. The only one I've seen that isn't is the Minnesota multiphasic personality inventory, I think. Um, anyway, that's all left brain. When you're, uh, if you do a job, it's basically a left brain job. They've been herding us into the left brain because they understand the left brain. Uh, they're controlled by uh, an AI. They're controlled by a, a created um, computerized um, system. They worship this system. And this system works on algorithms. Um, you go from one step, you go to step two, and you make a decision. And then you make that decision, you go to step three. No matter how fast the computer works, it works on an algorithm. If I'm wrong about that, write me, please. I've never heard of a computer that works on directly knowing. It might seem like that because they're fast, but they work on computer modeling. And what they're doing, according to Brian too, is modeling your brain, if you're a TI, by looking at your patterns. Okay, what's going to piss Catherine off? Hmm, oh, she's really sensitive to blah, 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 blah. Okay, let's send one of those. Let's do some street, street theater and watch her. And then we'll, we'll plug, we'll write that in our TI. And so in our hive mind, we know that pattern and that's it. So that's, that's what they seem to be doing. And they're watching you. But you don't have to stay in the maze. You have contact with your right brain especially women whose corpus uh, coliseum, which is, the, which is the connecting fibers between the two halves, is more prevalent in women. And the trick to getting out of the matrix, I think, is having access to your right brain, being able to go into the right brain and go back into the left brain, which you need to function on this earth. Let's face it, they've created the matrix around the left brain, and so you need to use that to eat and survive and everything. But you don't need to stay there. 
and you can ex you can uh, spend uh, great amounts of time in the right brain. When you're in the right brain, according to Brian too, they're frustrated. They're not gathering data. You're you're not, you're of no use to them when you're in the right brain. So let me describe, let me characterize a little bit about the left and the right brain. The left brain, of course, is very linear. It's very patterned. It's very predictable, especially when it's in fear. And what they do with TIs and what they do with all of society through television, because it's a hypnotic, uh, the sigils and hypnosis and, and chemistry, chemistry your body will secrete to keep you in a hyper agitated fearful state some people have said that that's one of the reasons that children are being born at earlier and earlier uh, ages is because they watch tv and tv keeps them frightened and an organism that's frightened wants to reproduce faster to get its progeny in there I don't know whether that's true or not, but it's a fear-based algorithmic existence, and that's what you're in. And I had my uh, son up here for uh, a week, and I hadn't been back to the United States in a long time. And that left brain uh, slave to the system is is like I can see it's like a it's like a it's like an organic plant growing up around them, growing up around people in these more mechanized societies. The right brain has, is connected to uh, the, the consciousness of the universe, your real self. And from that, you can access direct knowing. Uh, for example, they've done, this is corrupted data too, but I'm going to use it as an example. You can feel somebody watching you. And they found that this works uh, it only works when the people who are running the experiments believe. If the people that are not running the experiments don't believe it doesn't work. But we've all had the incidents of <clears throat> someone watching us. And you're just feeling, God, they're there. Well, you haven't run through your left brain at all. You know that directly. It's direct knowledge. And you access that Sometimes when you meditate, depending on what meditation you're using, depending on how shielded you are, you can access it through listening to music and getting totally enthralled. You can access it through a lot of different ways. And I've had notes already from TIs. I do this, and it really helps me get out of it. I had a woman named Audra that called me, and she says when she, if she can immerse herself in total love, which is totally a right brain thing, She's fine. She's happy. She goes along with her life. Uh, I would have put her interview on, but the, but she uh, but the, the audio was so bad. I might try to go back and talk to her again. But anyway, I think that down through history, for thousands of years, as long as we've been afflicted with this cancer, psychopathic, satanistic cancer that humanity's been been inflicted with, there have been people who have been working their way out of it through these various different things. Uh, meditation, yoga, Zen Buddhism has this thing called koans. And I've mentioned this a few times, but I'm not sure many people know it. It's a nonsensical, paradoxical statement that your left brain cannot deal with. To, to embrace it, you have to enter your right brain. Now, this isn't a Cohen, but this is, the, this is the kind of thing I'm thinking about. Uh, if you study human behavior like I have for all my life, you'll find that there's elements of free will, but there's also elements of fatalism. Uh, you'll find that most deep truths are paradoxical, and this is one of them. And your left brain cannot deal with this paradox. They cannot deal with any paradoxes. The only thing that can, the only part of you that can embrace a paradox is your right brain. And when you're embracing a paradox, you're not in your left brain. They have no access to you. 
So anyway, what I'd like to do is I'd like to do some science. Uh, since we can't do it in a laboratory, and we're going to be subject in the science with massive deceivers, because we know we're infiltrated, our ranks are so infiltrated with deceivers, that we're going to have to sort through this, the, the team and I. What I'd like to do is set up a website and do an open source investigation. Um, I would like to, I, I don't know, I need your input into how to do this. Uh, people have suggested Facebook would be the easiest, but I don't know how public investigations will work on Facebook. I don't know how, I mean, that's totally deep state. I don't know how corrupted we'd be. If somebody has an answer, they can write me. But I'd like to put up different uh, articles that I'll write or anybody else can write, send them to me about different ways to get into your right brain, get into love, if you will. Get into your contentment. Uh, follow a, a lot. There's a lot of Eastern practices, and there are even even some Christian practices that might get you there. If you've used them, I want you to write me and tell me um, what's working. But also, since Brian too has told us that there's many different programs. My God, how many programs in MK Ultra? Uh, I don't know. 247. 247 programs in MP Ultra. There's a lot more programs in the in the uh, TI. Uh, what we're being subjected to. So along with what's getting you out, describe your targeting. So we can know what what they're you see. It's custom made for you. So what they're finding your vulnerability, and what's been able to get you out. And I think what I'd like to do with all this data is compile this data in a publication of some sort at the end. But since it's open source, you can come in and out and learn from it as we're going in. Next week on the forum, hopefully we'll have it set up and we'll have a place for you to go to log in your, your learning. The ultimate thing is to frustrate their attempts, is to frustrate their attempts by not giving the data that they want and being able to get into your right brain. The answer isn't hiding in your right brain. The answer is always balance. But they've created such a massive left brain entrapment mechanism that very seldom, uh, very, uh, very seldom do we get into the right brain. Um, Ramola, we were talking yesterday, and she said she does that in, in certain ways when she's in an art gallery or when she's, she's enjoying that type of thing. And she is an artist. She's, she's a journalist, but she's an artist. And for her to only spend that limited time in that enjoyment phase shows you how influential this left brain trap is. I mean, when we talk about our our targeting and how they've done and how they deceive us, that's all left brain stuff. That's all the maze. That's all finding our way out of the maze or finding a glitch in the matrix. Uh, to get out of the maze, we need to actually devote part of our lives pursuing love, happiness, things that they can't, they can't track. They can't track direct knowing. Uh, there was a, uh, I, I don't have it, it I, I'm sorry, I should have pulled this up. The, the video I sent you, Romola. Mm -hmm. uh, do, Jill Boy, both Taylor? Yeah. Yeah, do you want me Jill, to pull it up? Uh, yeah, well, I don't know whether we have time to show that, but let me, right. we'll list it below. It's a, it's a video of a person who, she's a brain scientist. I mean, she's a, she's a neuroscientist. She's not a consciousness study. She's a hardcore, let's look at that brain. The difference between, I think the brain is a component of consciousness. She thinks consciousness is a component of the brain, but I bet she doesn't anymore. Anyway, what happened to her is she suffered a stroke. And the stroke took down her left brain. Actually, I've had the same incidents. I had a mini stroke that took out my ability to talk. 
for uh, like 10 or 15 minutes. And although it was shocking, it was absolutely fascinating because I could feel the words piling up in me. I was still having the thoughts, but they wouldn't come out. Uh, Jill has a more comprehensive, she went through a full bone stroke and it took out a lot of her left brain functioning. She talks about what it's like to, to just be forced to be in your right brain and what her existence was in that right brain. She couldn't conceptualize herself in this tiny physical body. She felt like she was part of the whole environment. And that's actually, uh, in consciousness development, that's what happens when you climb the ladder. You become less identified with your body and more identified with groups, living beings. Eventually, I haven't got there yet, the whole cosmos. So, uh, I'm sorry I used the word cosmos. Uh, but anyway, so that's, that's why I like to try to start. Uh, Mindy and I are going to put together, we're going to try to find little training modules that will teach you about consciousness growth, some of these different Eastern practices, practices. Uh, I'm sure there are some. Um, creativity. Uh, creativity, ways to foster creativity. Um, and, you know, we can work on those things and you can take these modules, learn, try it. It's not a quick fix. You're not going to be able to uh, learn, uh, unlearn your left brain conditioning in a week or two or three weeks. It'll be a little by little. But here's my theory. My theory is that you're being squeezed like a, like a wet cake of soap. And humanity is either going to drop down into transhumanism and we're going to be we're going to succumb to the hive mind or we're going to shoot out of it and become what we really are which is a balanced right-brained heavy individual that's got access to their whole self and they're not trapped in this left brain functioning so Anyway, we'll try to set up that this week. We'll try for you. We'll try to put together training modules. I'm gonna, I have a friend of mine I'm gonna hire to help us put some of that together. He's a good thinker. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to produce some of that to go along with what we're doing in the maze, in the left brain, through the Techno Crime Fighters Forum. So do um, you guys wanna add stuff on that or? Uh, um, I, it's fabulous. I mean, fabulous. Those are ideas. Those are ideas. Great. Um, I'm sorry, I'm hearing an echo. I'm hearing an echo. But uh, all you I want to say is. They're not letting you say it. They're not letting you say it, Ramola. Oops, she got out. She'll probably get back. She got out. She'll probably go back in. Um, so. I think she was just attacked. Or she probably wanted to say something important. I think this is brilliant because, um, you know, for those who weren't um, here last week, I mean, this entire hive minding is, is actually real. Um, people are, you know, having chips implanted and hooked up to a supercomputer who uh, a supercomputer that works their brains nonstop. So anything we can come up with to actually break out so that we can shut this down is is very important. Sorry, Ramula, I was just filling in for you. No audio. We can't hear you, Ramola. They must have hit your computer or something. What you could try yeah. to do is switch the audio off and on, maybe on uh, on the software and maybe also on the hardware. Sometimes that re um, relaunches it. You know. Okay, can you this, hear me now? Yeah. Yes, we oh, do. Okay, yes. so not only did they kick me out, they messed with my settings on my computer. Isn't that strange? This this shows yeah. you the extent to which I'm being cyber hacked. It's amazing because the settings were changed and this particular headset was not selected when obviously it was earlier. <laughs> oh, so, 
So all I wanted to say was, bravo, those are two fabulous ideas. I love them both, the open source crowd investigation to find out what's really going on, you know, to, to get the military documents, to get all of the information from both the surveillance world, the surveillance intelligence world, and the military world to get the information, throw it in together, and, you know, the targeting world, get the um, on-the-ground information and experience from the TIs, because TIs are the ones with the most knowledge currently about what's going on, you know? And, um, and of course, scientists who are whistleblowing, you know, they're also, obviously, they are in the know. Uh, so we need their help. And, you know, I have no, nothing much to contribute in terms of platform, but I think there are some people with IT knowledge in our midst. Ahmed Nani, for instance, has a lot of IT awareness. He might be able to help you find the best platform to do a crowdsourcing investigation. Uh, and I know David Beverly also helps, right? So. Well, David, David, will, David will be on this, I'm sure. Um, we've got people who volunteer to set up. Now, this is kind of a separate investigation from from the, from the left brain investigation, which we're conducting, uh, find out all about targeting and everything. This is to find out about escaping through the right brain. Yes, that's. I How thought there were two do. different ones, right? I thought there were two different ones, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. The tactical okay. crime fighter. You guys, you guys have an open source on that. Oh, we don't. I thought that's what you were putting together. You're putting together an open source on consciousness. Is that right? Yeah, on consciousness. Okay. The open source we're looking for, uh, you have to describe your targeting. A couple of reasons. One, so I can know that you're a target because there's some tells that I even, I even know. Uh, two, what type of program are you in? Are you in one that's more... Um, Street theater uh, with a little bit of uh, energy weapons. Are you heavy energy weapons and heavy? And then we've got Millicent, who's been in the program for a long time, that's got chips. And there'll be different ways to get out. I'm already working one on one with Millicent to find, take baby steps to try to get her free so she can enter her right brain more easily. But uh, what I want to know is uh, what's going on with you and what you found that works. And I'm sure it'll be like I've, I was a meditator before this and I've got he more heavily into it. And while I'm meditating, they're not, they're not attacking me right now. What type of meditation are you doing? It seems to work in this program. So this will be great information. You'll be able to match up your type of targeting. Several people who have ways of climbing out of the maze into these escape. I guess I'm finding escape mechanisms. And they're going to be, I think they're going to go along with the ancient teachings, uh, the ancient gurus, the people who have, who have escaped uh, the matrix down through the years. And a lot of those are tried and true practices that haven't been part of our society. <clears throat> In school, we don't learn. Uh, we learn to play sports. We learn to compete. We learn left brain. We don't learn how to uh, go to an art gallery, sit in front of a painting, and lose yourself in that painting. I mean, that's not part of our education. Should be. Should be. But uh, so that's what I'm looking for. I'm not looking for energy weapons here. I know there's, we're gathering a lot of data and, and uh, Rebola is publishing stuff on energy weapons and patents. I just got a list of uh, patents come from uh, Eric Karlstrom. He's investigating that. He's got that pretty much under control. What I want to find out is how we can get out of this through conscious expansion. And I know we can. And uh, what's, what's really great and what's really a gift to us is that all four of our techno crime fighters have extremely uh, sharp left brains, but they all have evidence that they have strong right brains also. I mean, uh, with Ramola and her writing and her creativity, with 
the amazing stuff that Catherine comes up with. We've got Karen with an amazing sense of humor. And her art, the cartoonist and a caricaturist. She's a cartoonist and a caricaturist also. And then, uh, of course, Melisent, who, well, her last degree was in a spiritual topic, in a right brain, more of a right brain topic. So, so we have, uh, we'll have testimonials and we'll have things that, well, we'll be able to throw it off of people with strong right brains and left brains. And, uh, Anyway, that's what I wanted to say, and I wanted to get that started. Hopefully, we'll start this week. And I think, what do you, what do you guys think? I think it could be a regular part of Techno Crime Fighters. If you know, I'll, I'll suggest stuff, or we'll all talk about what we found out, and that. Absolutely. If you, if we go through different, you know, different ideas and work on them, you know, that would be great. I. Right. I it's very brilliant because, um, you know, one of the things I really liked is that when you uh, said um, for us to find our way out, we have to spot um, the chinks, we have to spot the gaps. And, and as the rats, we have to get through the gaps. Um, and um, one of the, the um, kind of metaphors or, or you know, uh, images I used in the very beginning when, my, when I put together the team was, I said, what we are actually in is um, in, in terms of, you know, the kind of uh, defense and military uh, uh, vocabulary, we are in an assault tunnel. So when you have, you know, some sort of fort you're trying to protect from people, you try to guide them down one bit, which is to their mind, the only way in or the easiest way in, and you put all your weapons pointing at them to take them out as they're coming through. Now, we have been put into an assault tunnel without wanting to storm a fort. And we didn't realize that our mere existence and our mere questioning is already storming somebody's fort of lies. But that's what it is. And as soon as they realize you can storm their fort, they will put you in this assault tunnel. And the idea is to shoot you up before you ever get to the other end. Um, so this is really dangerous. But and when you're in an assault tunnel, you have only two options, basically. I mean, number one is you, you must never stop. If you stop, you die. That's the whole point. So you have to move quickly forward as quickly as you can. And then you have two things. Number one, you have to, as you're moving forward, you have to take out every single assault point going forward. You have to attack it, ideally take it out for the people who come behind you. And second of all, you have to look at ways out at the smallest ga gaps, you know. And, and that's part of um, looking for ways out because people are hooked up to this um, supercomputer and it's very powerful. So anything you can show us, um, Paul, is, is, um, will be a lifesaver. We need to regain our okay. I want to I wanna say something that's going to sound really, this is, the, this is the weirdest thing that Paul's said so far. We have, we, people, humanity, has access to this right brain this infinite computer, this infinite awareness. Uh, the computer is modeled, you know, we have total access to all information. We do through the right brain. We're part of it. It's not separate from us. They only have access to AI. So they have all of their stuff involves the clunky algorithm, no matter how fast they make it. They don't have access to this right brain. There are, there are more things involved in humanity and the, and the forces that we're fighting does not have access to this. And a lot of their minions do not have access to this. So this gives us a weapon. Uh, if you want to call it a weapon, I think when you, weapons are lethal, this is not lethal. This is love, this is contentment. This is happiness. We have access to this and they don't. That's why their art is different. That's why they, that's why they torment their children. They're different species, honestly. So that's crazy. And I hope that doesn't turn people off to this. It's not um, crazy, Paul. When you, when you say things like that, it makes me think of yogi signs, actually, which is a little bit removed from what we've been discussing so far. But I'm, I'm really thrilled that through you, your consciousness studies and your your, your awareness, you know, we can bring this into the conversation as well. Because as you know, when I first started my website, I had a little section for consciousness and I started to develop it and then I stopped because I was getting so caught up in the journalism and so forth. But, uh, but in yogi science and, you know, in the, the theory of the chakras, 
which talks about energy points across the body. Uh, one of the highest um, uh, spaces of awareness is the heart chakra. To exist, uh, to bring one's awareness down to the Anahata chakra, to exist in that heart space, so that you're in a sense wrapped up in that sense of consciousness, which is connected with things that you love people that you love and you're caught up in that rather than being caught up in the external left brain scenario of the weapons that are being used against you. So, you know, lately, actually, I've been trying to do a little bit more of that, trying to work in that heart space and do a little bit more meditation and actually sit out in the garden and read, which gives me a few moments, you know, to reflect and just to look at, you know, the flowers and the birds that visit the garden and so forth, which takes you into a different space, really. And, and you know, meanwhile, there are planes, drones, helicopters going crazy over my backyard, chemtrails. And sometimes I record it and sometimes I don't bother, you know, because I'm far more interested in reading my book um, but it does give me that those few moments of reprieve um, and it, so I kind of know what you're talking about and I kind of always related to yogi signs and what the yogis say you know about getting into heart space and existing in a state of you know well they say love for God you know which is about meditation where you uh, try to reach God through meditation by entering that quiet space inside of you and allow for a space where God or heavenly peace or whatever enters you and comes toward you. So um, that that's sort of what I was thinking about. Was yeah, one of the deep, one of the deep uh, yoga teachings that I got was you can't ascend in your chakras or expand in consciousness unless you're in a state of complete relaxation. Oh yes, yeah. And what, what they've done, I've watched my kids now. They've got these iPhones that you need to to, to negotiate the, uh, the matrix. And they're like this all the time. They're yeah. not sitting, staring up. They're not in their head. They're not in their, they're, we keep them focused in that left brain reality 100% of the time. And they're strangers to the right brain. Also, I want to tell you something about psychopaths since I've been studying them for a couple of years. In consciousness development, there are stages. I'm sure that most people are familiar with a guy named Jean Piaget, who worked with children, how they go from one stage to another. If you've had your children, you know they go through this stage, and then when they get to this age, they go through this stage. My dogs do the same thing. They have trouble with potty training at this stage. If you don't do anything, that'll clear up at the next stage. But I don't want to go into dog psychology. Stage, one of the lowest stages, right before what they call the conformist stage, which normal humans automatically, almost always automatically enter at six or seven years old, is the conformist stage. Psychopaths never get past what they call the protective stage, self-protective stage, which precedes the conformist stage. So they're, they just don't, they don't go up the chakra ladder. They stay in your base chakra. That's why everything's about sex. Everything's about the anus. Everything's that they live in the lower chakras. You're human. You can go all the way up and out. You can it's like an escape. The psychopaths are down there. They want you down there. They want you trapped in the left brain, lowest chakra reality you can, where it's you against them. You know, they took the uh, monetary system away, or they, they took certain, uh, I think, dollars away from India. And they expected mass uh, consternation. What they don't realize is they're doing it to humans. And humans have compassion and caring. And they took care of themselves. That's why they have to study us. Because we have moves that they have no idea. They're down there in a the self-protective stage. It's all about you and your stuff. And, you know, you have to teach your... When your child goes through this, you teach them to share stuff because it's not naturally programmed at that age. Which is but why they're trying they're trying to stamp out our humanity currently by, you know, running this global totalitarian fascist program around the world, you know, and the AI neuro um, neurotech and the transhumanist stuff is one aspect of it. The other aspect is the surveillance state, which, you know, they're seeking to expand intensively around the world. 
um, so that they stamp out precisely what you were talking about, this access to a greater sense of being or a greater sense of consciousness. And it's, it's, so, so that's the war, and that's and they've been planning this for thousands of years. I mean, they've been worshiping. Well, uh, I was reading a book uh, yesterday that talks about um, pre-animite people. This is, uh, I don't know whether this is mythology or not, but you can take it for what it is. Uh, Adam and Eve, Eve wasn't the first woman. He was the first woman created of man. Before Eve, there was another woman named Lilith. I don't know if you've ever heard of her. But uh, the lineage of Lilith is opposed to the lineage, uh, the lineage of Adam. And they've been corrupted and inter, inter, interspersing and been fighting for thousands and thousands of years. Uh, this is just the most recent incarnation. And this is the incarnation which we have to beat them in, because I think this is the last stand. We need to use, like uh, Catherine is saying, we need to use, to use everything in our old arsenal. It's, it's all out. Um, luckily, we have millions of TIs around the world who are, they're, they're under pressure to do something. We've got like a, a bunch of people who are, they may not have wanted to wake up, but they were tossed in the rabbit hole. And uh, if we can work with them, I think we have a great start to, uh, that's, that's the way I look at it. Maybe it's, maybe it's too grandiose, but uh, I think that's where we are. I think you're absolutely right, Paul. Absolutely right, Paul. I think that's exactly spot on. And um, you know, we, we talked about earlier about how urgent it is that we all find uh, the chinks in the armor, that we find the chinks in the and so on. And um, you know, I I, so I just became conscious of the time, but I also want to just, um, for my part, just briefly take literally a minute and a half or two minutes to actually finish off something that ties everything we said together because we started um, talking about psychology and how it's used in the media. And then, you know, we talked about the corruption of the media and how they're covering up horrific crime and how they're presenting a false image and a false image that entirely engulfs you and entraps you uh, in various ways. And, and then you talked about consciousness and how to get out. And um, one of the things that I've um, actually, I was, I, was, I was burning to share it on the show today. And I know that we're overrunning, but I just want to show you something because it's, it's something that blew my mind today and I don't know what to make of it. So maybe this is an exercise to all our viewers to take everything that we said today, take all the analysis skills that we presented, all the, you know, um, and also what, what Paul said, and think about how you're going to slip into your right brain to figure this out. First of all, what the hell's going on? And second of all, what on earth to do about it? And I think that's, you know, this is not just a homework. This is serious people. This is like, you know, hand to hand, uh, you know, combat. Um, and what happened is the following, and, and this will lead on to media and everything, because I had kind of like a, a real big surprise today. So I mentioned a couple of episodes ago that I, um, you know, I was attacked in Manchester and I was trying to get my crime report from Grand Greater Manchester Police. And the officer who was kind of messing me around and refused for now, I think something like eight months to send me my crime report is a certain inspector, Stephen Miskell. So today I thought, right, I want to call up Inspector Miskell after I mentioned him on the show before last. And I want to talk to him on the phone and ask him what the hell's going on. But instead of using his uh, number, I first wanted to um, find out who he is. So I started searching, and to my great surprise, I find no trace of an Inspector Miskell at Ashton Police Station. So I went to the Greater Manchester Police website, and there they have all the boroughs listed, and it's very, very well done. And at every borough, and I went to the Ashton um, underline on 8 Manchester Road, and I clicked on that, and you can see images of all the inspectors there. But there is no Inspector Miskell. There is no Inspector Stephen Miskell listed anywhere. So I went through all the different Ashton sub-departments, and there is no trace of him. And I thought, now that's really odd. So maybe he's somewhere else, you know? So I thought, let's go back to the internet, away from the Greater Manchester Police website, and let's just search for In Inspector Stephen Miskell. And I think I just fell through a trapdoor down the rabbit hole. 
because the following thing happened. Let me share my screen because I just did a normal search for Stephen Misko and Spectre and I came up with two news articles that blew my mind and I'm just going to show it to you and I'm going to present the case as a homework to everybody and please use your consciousness and your deductive reasoning and everything you've got to figure this out for me. So look at this. When you search on normal um, Google search, the first thing, so if you search for Stephen Miskell, you come up to this article in the, in the Telegraph in the UK and it reports about the death of two very young um, police officers. And the, um, the death in, in the um, Telegraph is reported as a great sacrifice, in inverted commas, of murdered PC Fiona Bone and there's another one um, that died alongside her. And this is the funeral of um, PC Fiona Bone here. And, and you know, they have the funeral and, and conveniently the image of her that they're carrying is big enough so that when the media photographs it, it's just perfect size. So they had some exercise um, in this. But anyway, um, as you're actually going through, um, this is just the, the report of it. And then um, when you search for Stephen Miskell, um, Inspect Sergeant Stephen Miskell um, spoke at the funeral and said that Fiona was wonderful. She was wonderful at keeping colleagues and so on. Um, now, this is the report in the Telegraph. So I thought, oh, yes, Sergeant Stephen Miskell. So this is a report from 2012. So by 2016, four years later, Sergeant Miskell must have become Inspector Miskell. So then I searched on. Uh, and then I thought this funeral is really interesting. And then you have the report on the Daily Mail, right? And this is the lady who died and so on. And Stephen Miskell indeed spoke at the funeral and so on, right? Um, and you've got this report. And curiously, already this Daily Mail report kind of got my interest because they showed the same image three times. Here. They show the image here, and then on the third one, they show the image, sorry, my, uh, my scroll down kind of stalled, uh, which is very curious. Usually it doesn't stall, but now it does. Sorry, um, let me sh scroll down to the third image because that's the one that's, it was just here, here, sorry. Oh, my computer's being messed with, so this is important. So this is the first image, that's the second image, and the third image, three virtually identical images and then you have what might be a hand sign because they are both looking into the camera. Now, he is holding three fingers and he's showing the first and the last. So um, interesting, isn't it? But I thought, you know, here, of course, digitally, you're, you're, you can't be wasting space. But to show that the same image three times was peculiar. And again, when you search for Stephen Miskell, he really appears here and he's, he spoke at the funeral and took place in Manchester. So he is a police officer um, of the Manchester police. That's Manchester Cathedral and the funeral. But then when I searched on a bit, the other article I found was that police pal who paid tribute at funerals of Fiona Bone and Nicola Hughes. So these are the two people who died, these two police officers who died, were actually murdered at a burglary. And the police person who paid tribute dies a year later at age 42. And this person who died is a PC Tracy Miskell, who was found dead just minutes after returning home from the gym with husband Stephen, who also serves with GMP, Greater Manchester Police. So I've got a Stephen Miskell, who doesn't want to release my crime report, who doesn't appear on the Greater Manchester Police site, and his partner died in 2013, one year after both of them paid tribute to the death of a couple of very young police officers, whereby the death is reported really oddly with something that could be hand signs. Now, I, what I want as an exercise to all the viewers is, first of all, is there Inspector Stephen Miskell at Greater Manchester Police? Question number one. Is there? Does this person actually exist, Stephen Miskell? If yes, I'm very sorry for his loss. If his partner also genuinely existed, 
And if these other two police officers genuinely uh, existed who died, I'm very, very sorry. But I'm, I'm even more concerned for Inspector Miskell because his partner dying, it, you know, his partner was 42, died exactly one year after two young police officers, female police officers died. It seems like the death of three women within a year uh, connected to Inspector Stephen Miskell. Now, if, if all these people exist, I'm absolutely shocked and I want to put to Inspector Miskell that his partner is said to have died of a prior undis undiagnosed heart and lung condition. Just died, poof. Like, what does that sound like to us people? You know, we have seen death like that. So it sounds like directed energy weapons. So if these people really exist, I, I, I want to talk to Inspector Misko more urgently than anything else. And he has to get his head around and, you know, directed energy weapons in my view. Now the alternative, which I don't know, and that's why I bring up the hand signs and the same image three times. And the last image is like this, right? So the, the fingers that are shown are this, right? So on the other hand, what if it's all fake? What if these two police officers of the great sacrifice, it's just a show, it's just fake news. And then the other person who's paid tribute just goes poof and disappears from the scene. And then what if this entire thing is just a show and these people didn't exist? Would that explain why Inspector Miskell doesn't appear on the website of Greater Manchester Police? Would it explain why he's messing me around and also gives me a phone number that is not actually um, the one at the main station? Um, doesn't reply to my text and could it be that Stephen Miskell is actually a code name, one of these fake IDs that everybody at Greater Manchester and everybody in the media knows is a fake Manchester police officer? Could this be the case? And I don't know the answer to that. So go figure, this could be a chink in the armor, it could be a, a gap, a fault in the matrix. And it could be something where if you really want to investigate this and also for all police officers involved, they have to step out of the matrix. They are hooked up to Tetra. So they will have to actually listen very carefully what we have got to say and especially what you've got to say, Paul. So that's me finishing and rounding up. That's a true mystery. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's very interesting. Of course, you know, you have the whole notion of sacrifice. Uh, that plays a big part in their uh, religious rituals and uh, a lot of people get promotions you know it's it's a deep rabbit hole we're into and uh i'm happy that everybody's following us and the people that are on the in the chat room thank you for your comments uh thank you to uh catherine horton and romola d uh this has been it's always thrilling for me because i get to spend my uh thursday mornings with uh, the most fascinating people in the world. So uh, I Paul, hope you've enjoyed it. Paul, before we close, could we make a tiny request? Okay. Because this would be a perfect moment, because I think Catherine just demonstrated, you know, possible false flag in action over here. This would be a perfect moment to play your wonderful Crisis Actor video that you sent around that all of us have been enjoying vastly. Okay, that's great. Why don't we end with that? And... Uh, after that, we'll just. Uh, do you have it queued up? Do you have it queued up? Oh, do I have it queued up? Actually, I don't. But let me do it really fast. Actually, I have. Got, I've got it queued up, but I'm just about to. Okay. The I'm about to increase the volume on my speakers because I think last time, um, the the actual um volume wasn't high enough, so it's on hundred percent. So let's see. Um, can you guys let me know if you can actually hear properly? Because I'm not sure if my computer's loud enough. So okay, go. Yeah. I absolutely loved it. So Paul sent around this thing. And where is it? I think it's this one, right? Um, yes, that one. I think that one. Um, please shout if it's not loud enough, and then Ramola can play it. Yes, I'll just This is hilarious. I think like... Oh, this, hang on. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Are you in the lead? Are your stage attacks not going as important? Is this loud enough? No, no turn it up. It needs, it needs louder, right? Yeah, it needs yeah. to be a little bit louder. Then you play it, Ramola, because I think your speakers are better. Oh, dear. I need the link again. <laughs> oh, hang on. I'll, I'll post it to you. Just a second. Let me just stop sharing my screen.
Um, and this will be totally worth um, worth it, people, because I have to say I crack, cracked up laughing. I think this is this is basically what we've got to say about the media and what to do about it in a nutshell. That's really true. Yeah. Is it called Harrison Hanks? The El oh, there you've got it. Okay, let me just go do it. Okay, I've got it queued up. So let me um, share screens at this point. Yeah. We'll link you this below also. And make it really big. Oh, Paul, can you just, uh, can you make her screen the main one? And you, Ramula, make it big. Yeah, and just. We're not getting any audio. So I, I guess we probably put the link in, into the bottom. Because I oh, think we should actually. Uh, this. It's good for oh. a laugh. And it tells you this person has gone through and uh, he well, well, is well, very well, awake, well. knows what's going on, and he makes a. They hate to be making made fun of. This is a strength, really effective. Yeah. Actually, you know what, Ramol? I think we should put the link. Mindy, can you put the a link um, into the chat? Because I think people should watch this in their browser. It's absolutely hilarious. Um, and it's, uh, you know, unfortunately, it's just not loud enough. Somehow the, the volume settings got changed on our computers. Oh, I see. That's what happened. Yeah, because, um, you know what, um, there was there were videos we played in the past, and they were perfectly loud. And now today, they, they've been muted. I think it's just too powerful. It's like when we start sharing clip, clips, you know, that's when it hits. Yes, up. this one is an absolutely powerful, absolutely stunning <laughs> video. I think everybody in the world should see it. Yeah, especially That's everybody right. that, you know, the people of London with all their attacks, you know, terrorists. Yeah. And unlike all the fake journalists out there whom we can't endorse, I highly endorse Harrison Hanks or whoever the actor was. <laughs> yeah, he did a good job. Okay, well, that's the end. Watch that video. You'll, you'll have a good laugh. And uh, what are we doing? I'm still typing in the link. Well, we can put the link. Oh, she wants to put the link into. Uh, there we go. It's okay, the, the link's in the chat. It'll be listed below the video if you're watching this on video. Thank you very much for uh, watching this. We've had a lot of fun, and uh, we have a lot of fun, and we're working on the biggest problem that's hit mankind in a long time. So stick with us. Come back next Thursday. We'll be here. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. <laughs>